So this is our rough agenda for the night. Um, I'm Hugh Ogamot. I'm a senior research fellow in wave structure interaction at UWA um, and was part of the hub. Um, have a lot of interest in wave structure interaction for offshore oil and gas and renewable energy. Um, basically, Wenhua and I, Wenhua's there, will be doing most of the um, talking. And the idea is that Paul and Leifan will interrupt us if we say anything stupid um, from online. So you might hear them more or less, who knows. Um, the agenda is basically some quick background slides, which maybe cover a bit of the same material a couple a couple of times, but just to, to drum in, I guess, when we looked back over the hub, uh, we did a, a bunch of things. Um, and one of the common themes, I guess, strongly influenced by Paul Taylor and his, his background was using wave groups to probe sort of wave structure interaction of different types. And we thought that would be a way to sort of collect some of the work that we did, the, the common linking theme across some of the some of that work. So that's why the masterclass is, is using wave groups for nonlinear wave structure inter interactions. Um, so I hope that you're interested in that. Um, that's what we'll be talking about. So a bit of background. Then we've got um, four sort of application type talks. Um, depending on how we're going, we can sort of split dinner in there at the appropriate time. Um, and then uh, opportunities at the end, just I guess show where we might be going with this. Um, hopefully Paul will be able to, to deliver that part. Um, and feel free to ask, we sort of haven't listed a question session in the uh, in the agenda there, but I guess feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, yeah, it shouldn't be super formal. So just to start, um, I guess there are a lot of people in the room that know a lot about waves, but just briefly talk about waves and, and, and um, I guess, a little bit of, of our take on why we've done what we've done. So yeah, that, that's an outline. It's pretty basic regular waves, irregular waves and wave groups, wave groups being sort of, the, as I said, that linking theme through the work that we've done in the hub. Um, so again, um, maybe just to, to start off, I mean, we're not experts actually in waves, we're really experts in wave structure interaction, I guess. So what we what we are interested in is not so much the waves, but the responses of some system that we're trying to design. Um, we, we also like waves, but um, the, the applications tend to be on the system. So I guess what we're trying to do with, with these waves is, is ultimately find the wave that's giving the largest response that's going to govern the design. Um, and, and there's obviously a place for whatever the simulation or test is that, that gives you that result. But then on, along that path, there's also um, you're trying to look at extract the wave structure interaction behavior um, from, say, tests or simulations um, so that the, you'll understand the nature of that wave structure interaction, which will bring you um, along your design path and, and get you to that sort of final value. Um, so, so waves are nice. Um, we can use potential flow theory to describe waves. So that means we can use a Laplace equation, which is a linear uh, governing PDE. Um, and the complication, uh, well, potential flow theory is nice. It's inviscid in the incompressible fluid. Um, irritational motion of that fluid, um, assuming we, we don't have wave breaking, which uh, despite the picture on the previous slide, we don't have in general in, in the talk. Um, and we also assume that the waves are long enough that surface tension effects are negligible. Obviously for, for waves, all the complication is in the free surface boundary condition. Um, so the governing equation is linear, but the free surface boundary condition in general is nonlinear. Um, so we don't actually know where that surface sits at any point in time. And, and that's essentially where a lot of the nonlinearity for waves enters a problem. Although once you put in a structure, then you get um, other stuff going on as well. So regular waves, just starting super basic. So um, waves at a point um, look like that. Um, regular waves have an amplitude. Um, so how high they get above the mean free surface. They have um, an angular frequency, omega, uh, which is just 2 pi over the wave periods at the time between crests. Um, and they have a phase phi, so that's that's just relative. There's nothing, um, no absolute phase, but the, the phase is just, just relative. Um, and in, in space and time, then we can bring in the spatial dependence through the wave number, um, which is just uh, 2 pi over the wavelength, the wavelength being the distance in space between crests. Uh, so far, so good. 
um, and, the, and the waves can propagate at an arbitrary angle to the coordinate system so we can have causes and signs in there. Um, but still the important thing, I guess, is you know, amplitude, frequency and phase and the frequency and the, the wave number are related through the, the dispersion relationship. So in general for finite depth um, for linear waves, uh, omega, the angular frequency is related to the wave number K like this. And in deep water that, that simplifies. Um, and so the importance of this is that waves, water waves are dispersive. So um, in deep water at least, um, longer waves travel faster. And so a group, um, an initial disturbance, say like that picture on the first slide, if you drop a rock in a pond, then the, the longer waves propagate away, away faster. And because um, uh, it's omega squared equals GK, so um, a variation in, in omega gives a larger variation um, in K. So the difference in the, essentially the bandwidth of waves in, in space and in time. Um, and we're just talking here about long crested um, monochromatic waves like in that illustration. So that's um, the most basic flavor of waves, and I guess the building block for, for everything else. Um, so you might use regular waves. So that's sort of a frequency domain, I guess, um, view of the world in some ways. Um, that, that wave that I showed on the previous slides has no beginning and no end. If you want to, um, in the time domain, run in a basin or in a flume, regular waves, um, then they have to start somewhere. Um, and so you might have your wave maker do that motion on the left hand side. It's just a sort of a regular wave that starts. But then by the time it's actually reached your model, it doesn't look like that anymore because your, your initial jump um, is just that a jump in Fourier space is basically made up of all, all frequencies. And so those frequencies spread, spread apart due to dispersion and you have this sort of transient at the start. Um, and eventually in, in your basin or in CFD, you might have reflections come back off the end walls or the side walls or whatever. Inevitably, it's a limited domain. And so kind of the best part of your test maybe is this initial transient, although you in regular ways, you're actually going to throw that away. You want to get to the steady state. Um, and also for regular waves, if, if you want to fill out, fill out a full frequency sweep, so you have some structure that you're interested in characterizing and you want to see how it responds to multiple frequencies, in, for regular waves, you need to test each of those frequencies separately. So if you do that in CFD, that's going to take you um, too long to be practical. Um, so waves are nonlinear, as I said, through the nonlinear free surface boundary condition. So um, just in, in deep water, say, of a regular wave, you introduce a um, lowest order nonlinearity as a second harmonic, um, which would manifest as um, sharper crests and, and flatter troughs as shown in the black profile at the bottom, which is made up of the, the blue linear curve that we had previously in the red second harmonic. I mean, the scales are essentially arbitrary here, but the point, the point is the shapes. Um, and, and I guess the phasing, so for waves, uh, the phase of the second harmonic is locked to the phase of the first harmonic. That's why they're called bound waves. So that those, those peaks in the red curve coincide either exactly with the peaks in the blue curve or exactly with the troughs. Um, so we talk a lot with, with wave groups about sort of manipulating phase. Um, and so the higher harmonics have a, have a special phase relationship to the, to the linear carrying components. Um, and then we can obviously go higher and higher order of, of effects in, in um, wave theory. Um, a third order, for example, um, lots of exciting things happen. Um, so the dispersion relationship is altered. So not only do waves of different frequencies travel at different speeds, but also waves of different amplitudes travel at different speeds, which for deep water is quantified um, in the dispersion equation here. Um, and indeed, there are lots of uh, a third order, um, a bunch of effects, I guess, that we'll sort of talk about, but probably not, not quantify. Um, and indeed, I guess, regular waves, nonlinear regular waves, if you propagate them for long enough um, in a basin will eventually um, just fall apart because of, of these interactions. Um, but that, you didn't have to propagate them for quite a ways for that to happen. So that's some of the features and benefits of, of, of regular waves as a, as a way to sort of probe wave structure interaction. Um, now, irregular waves, I guess, um, if we just in linear world just add up regular waves, we produce irregular waves. And so again, we have a sum over um, a hopefully a large number of components, all with their own individual amplitudes, 
frequencies and phases, and that again the the frequencies and wave numbers are related by the dispersion relation. Um, and in general, if we try and replicate what we might measure in the ocean, then the phases are chosen randomly, um, and the amplitudes are also chosen randomly, but they're they're taken from um, some expected shape of, of a of a wave spectrum, like a, a Johnsop or a Piskun Moskovitz, which typically has a most of the energy around a certain frequency, um, and then a, a high frequency tail, which um, you'll probably see in in, in future um, plots here. But again, um, you can make these waves so they're irregular in the sense um, that. Uh, you have a bunch of different frequencies, but they're all propagating in the same direction. So they're long crested. So they look like we've seen in the picture here, um, which doesn't look like the ocean um, very much. So we might also sort of probe how our structures respond to irregular waves. Um, obviously, we typically look at the statistics. So we also, if we have a, a wave spectrum, we could also collect a response spectrum in response to, to these waves. But then you need a long run to do that. Um, and basically, if you have a finite size base and you always get stuff bouncing off the walls and the ends um, well before you sort of have been able to collect meaningful statistics. In, in, in CFD, you can perhaps get around the reflections, but you can never really afford to run for long enough to collect statistics in irregular waves because um, that will just chew up all your, your computing power. So irregular waves um, are in some ways um, more realistic than regular waves, but there's still some, some issues perhaps. And again, you can um, add in the second order nonlinearity and get bound waves. So again, um, the red components are what we had last time. So the blue are the, the linear components. The red are the sum frequency components. So um, two uh, linear waves uh, at omega one and omega two give a, a sum frequency response at omega one plus omega two, so a higher frequency. And that's what you see there. So they wiggle fast. It's exactly the analog of what we saw for the regular waves previously. Um, and then there's a, a difference frequency as well. So omega one minus omega two, um, and then the exact values are given by that kernel H, but that we don't really sort of need to get into the details um, there. And in, in deep water, the um, the bound long wave, the bound difference frequency waves are very, very small, so we tend not to notice them for sort of offshore facilities, but in, in shallow water, they become more significant, um, as we've noted for doing shallow water mooring studies or, or something like that. Um, and so we might move on then to looking at uh, short crested waves. So. In this case, we sum not just over frequencies, but over directions. So we add up a bunch of regular waves of, of different frequencies and then a bunch that are going in different directions. So we have two sums there um, to make up our linear short crested wave field. And we choose the amplitudes from a directional spectrum now where the energy is distributed in frequency and direction space. Uh, and, and perhaps if we're lucky, um, we can assume that the frequency and directional variation are independent, although Maybe that's actually not not a very good assumption in general. Um, so that the wave field looks something like that, and it, it's it looks more like what you might see in the ocean, but it's a bit harder to figure out what's going on. And indeed, if you try and generate those in, in a wave basin of finite size, there's only part of the basin that's sort of usable. So only part of the basin give you the correct um, statistical properties for that directional wave field, um, because you're only making waves on probably one wall maybe on, on two walls, but still there's um, some issues there with the, the finite size. And it, it's actually becomes quite difficult to relate. So we, we typically do tests where we run the waves undisturbed and see, okay, what are our waves? And then we might run the waves with a structure that is interacting with them. Um, but if you measure the waves at one point in a directional wave field, it's quite difficult to say anything about, in a time resolve sense at least, in knowing the phases at another point adjacent. Um, and, and we've sort of um, uh, quantified that for sort of field data um, uh, in, in other work that we sort of won't talk about um, today. But uh, you, you need a lot more measurements, I guess, to characterize perhaps what's going on. Um, so, and, and again, we can have nonlinear, there are nonlinear 
um, interactions in, in this, these wave fields. So you have second order terms, bound terms, and now the nature of the second order interactions of those higher frequency wiggles that are bound to the linear components. Um, the kernel has, has basically changed because of the, the nature of the spread, the spread wave fields. So there are um, linear waves of all frequencies and directions interacting with each other to build up this um, nonlinear wave field. Um, and often um, to do well, this, this for some terms, it becomes quite tricky to do um, second order wave structure interaction uh, in this space. So wave groups are a different way of approaching things. So we try and subject structures to wave groups and see how they respond. And why might we do that? So this is just going back to our irregular wave field from before. If we have the same sum over a number of components, um, and each component is characterized by amplitude, frequency, and phase. If we just set all of those phases to zero at some point in space and time, then we get a time signal that looks like this. Um, so it's all localized, it's localized in space and time. And if the amplitudes are chosen appropriately, if the amplitudes are chosen um, so that they're actually pulled from the from the power spectrum, then the profile is a scaled autocorrelation function. So an autocorrelation function um, is a Fourier transform of the power spectral density. That's basically just what's written there. But the point is that that's the been shown theoretically by Lindgren in 1970 to be the average shape of a large wave. So this, um, if we choose our amplitudes like this and our phases to match, then, then we produce a wave which is the average shape of, of a large crest. And, and that has been termed new wave for, um, for about 30 years. Um, so this is, this is very useful. And again, I'm just um, in the first instance just talking about uh, long crested new wave. So it's, um, it, it has a long crest, long crest length. All the waves are traveling in the same direction. Um, so it's, it's a, a model for a large wave and we can choose the amplitude, which I'll come back to, to make it resent, represent a one in n um, extreme wave. Uh, but the point is that it's, it's, a, it's a localized compact group, but it includes the sort of under structure of the underlying spectrum because we've chosen the amplitudes of the components um, in line with this theory. So they're chosen from the power spectrum such that um, we've sort of retained some information from the underlying irregular wave field, but we've got now got this compact group and that's uh, really useful. And also useful is that this, you can prove it mathematically, but it's actually been borne out by field data. So a number of studies have been done on, on field data from various sites um, in the North Sea, um, Gulf of Mexico. I mean, a, a, anywhere Paul's got his hands on field data. Um, including Australia uh, in, in hurricanes, in, in North Sea storms, etc. So if you take the average shapes of, uh, or take take a, a wave record and pull out the largest waves and average the shapes of them, then you get something that looks like new wave. So it, it really works. And we can play with um, play with wave groups. Um, so the average shape of the largest wave is, is if you set the phase to zero, the average shape of the deepest trough is if you set the, the phases to 180 degrees. So that's um, what's shown there. You can have an up crossing or down crossing. You can shift. Once you have this shape, you can sort of play with the shape of the wiggles within the sort of envelope to get whatever shape um, that you need. You, you may have some structure which um, responds to, to most strongly to up crossings, for example, which you might be interested in. Um, and it's straightforward to do that. It's also pretty straightforward to make them. So I said before for regular waves, it's sort of the best part of the test was the transient. So just when the waves have arrived, because nothing has had time to get to the basin walls and bounce off or anything. So if it, to make a focus wave group, you, you make a paddle signal that kind of looks like the, the curve I've shown there. So you make all the um, high frequencies first and because of dispersion, they travel slowly slowly propagate. You gradually make lower and lower frequencies and eventually they all arrive at the same point at the same time. You've got this localized interaction, which nevertheless retains the structure of the underlying spectrum. Um, that's in linear theory. So these third order interactions, I said third order interactions could change the dispersion relation. So they can actually 
um, for a, a wave spectrum, they can actually change the shape of the spectrum as it propagates down the tank. So you might um, get a different shaped envelope to what you thought, and you might get a focus, the, the wave focusing in a different position to what you thought initially, which is one of the, the subtleties that you have here, particularly as the, as the amplitude of the waves gets bigger and bigger. So, you, but you can iterate on that because it's a fast test to do. You can run the wave and then iterate. Um, but the good thing is that the phase relationships between the components aren't affected by these nonlinear changes. And so that, that results really important when it comes to some of the techniques that we'll talk about later. So, it, and that, what I say there is true in, in deep, intermediate and shallow water, but if you get into extremely shallow water, then there's a different type of nonlinear interaction uh, for which that's no longer true. But in general, in, in um, water depths that basically we're interested in for offshore facilities, um, you can make these groups, and even though there's nonlinear evolution, the, the phase relationships hold. And that, that's uh, what a wave group might look like with its high harmonics. So it's got the blue sort of carrier wiggles, which is this underlying shape of, of the largest wave um, or uh, the linear components, and then bound to those are these, these red some frequency wiggles that are always there, and there's actually a, a difference frequency set down underneath the wave group that's, that's shown. Uh, and the higher harmonics are more localized than the, the linear components, as you might expect. Um, so we can also do this directionally. So if we also focus all the components now into one point, so they're all um, aligned at a focus point uh, in time and, and in space. Um, then you get something that looks like this, which maybe isn't the best illustration, but, but you can see the difference from some of the plots previously. So that, that large single large crest is, is localized in the center of the, the domain. Um, so we don't we haven't actually used a lot of directionally focused groups in the work we'll talk about today, but and one of the reasons I think it's a bit more challenging to um, to iterate because obviously you could get it sort of in the wrong place, um, not just down the basin, but you, you could potentially have the the directions not done properly. So um, there's, there's a few more degrees of freedom to play with when um, you're trying to uh, get it in the right spot. On the other hand, the, the third order interactions are actually weaker, so it's less likely to run out of focus. Um, and the classic example of a directional focus wave group is this one, if it plays. Anyway, you've already probably seen the bullseye wave, but it, uh, it's quite entertaining, so I'll try and get it going. Um, anyway, so that's a directionally focused wave. We will see that. Um, and, and just a note on how do we relate the amplitudes of wave groups to, to random fields, so we can use wave statistics. So the surface elevation um, is a linear random Gaussian process, and that means that the wave amplitudes follow a Rayleigh distribution. So we know how the wave amplitudes are dist distributed. And so if we want a, a one in N amplitude new wave, we can just calculate the amplitude alpha of the group using um, the standard deviation. And the, so N is the number of, um, N is the number of waves. Um, and so uh, uh, log, log N under the square root. So it doesn't actually increase very fast as we as we increase n. Um, but so we can take a random field and say relate um, this uh, this new wave to a certain level of response from that from that random random field. So uh, wrapping up uh, wave groups are transient localized packets which retain information about the underlying random field. Um, and they, they give us the ability to do high quality repeatable experiments with minimal contamination because the interaction all takes place in a short period of time before stuff has bounced off the walls or um, 
we don't we don't have to uh, have to run multiple experiments in CFD. So it's sort of a high quality way of doing experiments. We find, and that, that's we've used that in a bunch of applications, which we're going to talk about throughout this evening. Um, we sort of have. These wave groups are deterministic, so we have full control. We're not we're not doing random waves. We have full control of the phase and amplitude of each component, at least if we iterate, sort of give or take, messing around with the nonlinear interactions, um, and th and that becomes important. So we're basically playing with with everything in the wave field to try and extract the nature of the responses of the system that we're interested in. Um, so that was all I had um, for that one, and happy to take questions or. Uh, Spend a minute trying to get the YouTube video to work. <laughs> One more? You want to take over? We can't ignore the uh, the structure. We need to consider the diffraction of the wheel field due to the absence of the due to the presence of the structure. And uh, if that's larger than five, essentially we can ignore the or we can treat the scenario as uh, like. Um, no structure there, and we use the wave uh, kinematics to calculate the wave loads on the structure. And that is uh, and probably the uh, we're going to focus on the uh, the uh, the brain uh, area because uh, uh, we are interested in very uh, like a large uh, scale offshore structure like like uh, oil and gas platforms and uh, renewable energy device. And before uh, uh, going into the details, we need some like uh, assumptions. The first assumption is the viscous uh, effects is negligible. Uh, so uh, we avoid the nonlinearities here. And uh, <clears throat> then the second one is uh, we, uh, we assume we look at the wave steepness is uh, small, which is the wave height uh, by the uh, wavelength is small. And uh, <clears throat> Then we looking at the uh, like the cases with uh, like offshore structure is uh, uh, comparable to the uh, uh, wavelengths, so it has the diffraction effects. Uh, the the first scenario here is uh, uh, like on the left hand side of the the slides. Well, we assume someone holding someone strong enough to hold the uh, floating structure in the ocean. So it won't be uh, moving. And uh, when the waves come through the structure and uh, you know, we want to understand what is the wave loss uh, on the structure. And uh, typically, because uh, we have the assumptions in the previous slides, then now we can um, focusing on solving or find out uh, uh, like, uh, uh, velocity potential, and once we saw, sorted the uh, velocity potential out, we can calculate the wave loads on the structures, and uh, how to calculate the uh, uh, velocity potential. So th this is uh, kind of the uh, what we're going to do, and uh, it, it covers. Uh, it's essentially a boundary value problem. Uh, we need to uh, satisfy a couple of uh, uh, like uh, requirement to be able to solve the uh, equations and then find out the uh, velocity potential. And uh, for example, here we have the uh, wave surface, uh, 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 wave surface um, uh, conditions, and which means the uh, at the uh, the water surface, the particle velocity uh, should uh, should like uh, we, we have two surfaces. One is uh, wave surface. The other is uh, water particle velocity. So, at the surface level, uh, the the wave profile velocity uh, should meet should equal to the uh, water particle velocity. Because otherwise, the water particle will jump out of the water or into the water. And uh, also at the seabed. The water will uh, the, the velocity, uh, the normal velocity should be zero because otherwise the water will be, um, you, you know, the ocean will be dry. And uh, also at the uh, uh, at the wet surface of the uh, 
the structure, uh, we need to meet this requirement. That means uh, the the instant wave uh, uh, the instant wave velocity should equal to the uh, um, should equal to the uh, body velocity uh, the uh, to the uh, body velocity there, but that's different direction, and because uh, otherwise that's discontinuity at the uh, body surface, and and uh, th this is for the diffraction problem and for a fixed body, and uh, after that, uh, we know the body is floating, so. Uh, if we calculate the wave loads and the wave loads will force the structure to uh, to move uh, in the ocean. And uh, so this is a radiation problem. Uh, again, we assume someone is strong enough, can hold a, uh, like a platform, uh, oscillate the platform in the ocean. And when you oscillate that, you can generate waves. And then we need to solve this problem and uh, we need to find out uh, like a radiation velocity potential. And uh, this is uh, the, uh, the boundary value uh, equations for that. And because uh, that's pretty much the very, uh, you know, all the other conditions are the same as the uh, previous slides. So I didn't show that here, but the only difference is there at the moving body because of the boundary condition here is changed to like the radiation, uh, the radi radiation velocity, the, the velocity due to the radiation uh, at the wet, wet surface of the body should be uh, like equal to the body velocity. And uh, uh, that, that's the only difference between the two problems. And then uh, later on, you can see the similar equations when solving the problem. After solving this problem, we can uh, calculate the added mass uh, and the damping uh, coefficient uh, for the radiation problem. And uh, <coughs> now we come back to the full problem. And on the left, uh, very top uh, left, that, that is the green color is the diffraction problem, which is uh, the body is fixed. And uh, from here, we can calculate the uh, excitation force for the uh, on the structure and then the the uh, the, uh, the blue color is the uh, radiation problem so when when the body induced uh, uh, when the wave induced body motion you solve the boundary value problem what we can get is the coefficient for the added mass and damping and uh, we add the two problems together that give us the uh, coupled problem which is uh, uh, we've uh, we've uh, like uh, we've driven body motions, uh, floating body motions, and uh, and to solve the like uh, the body motion information, uh, we need to look at the uh, the motion equation here, and uh, the the blue color is uh, calculated from the uh, radiation problem, and the red color, the excitation force, is uh, uh, calculated from the diffraction problem. And then, uh, when we solve this uh, motion equation, uh, we, we can get the like the the displacement uh, for the uh, uh, six degree uh, of freedom motions for the floating body. And there are here uh, a few other uh, coefficients like uh, uh, capital M is the matrix for, for the mass and, and uh, the physical mass, and the K is the uh, hydrostatic force, and uh, we, we can calculate the, the, this coefficient quite straightforwardly. So after that, we're going to look a little bit detail about this equation. So as uh, we just mentioned uh, in the previous slides, for each item, actually, we can uh, calculate the coefficient for the different colors, and then we can uh, calculate the uh, solve this motion equation. And if we simplify this uh, equation, uh, we put the, uh, um, the, the term in the bracket as C, um, then what you're going to get is the uh, the ratio of uh, 
the uh, the motion uh, motion over the uh, amplitude of the instant wave, and uh, this you know this ratio we define as h, which uh, is the uh, response amplitude operator for the uh, floating structures. Essentially, that's a linear transfer function between the response and the inc incident waves, and. Uh, uh, so the for this part, uh, I would like to mention here uh, just to focus on one uh, unidirectional uh, scenario. Actually, the uh, transfer function is not only uh, a function of uh, a frequency, but also a function of the uh, the heading um, uh, of the instant wave and. Uh, uh, the, the good news is, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, the equations are looks very complicated, but we don't need to solve that now by hand, and we have softwares and uh, very commercial uh, uh, mature commercial softwares, and we gonna uh, like uh, yeah a couple of softwares available, uh, and uh, we we can do the uh, like a numerical simulations to calculate all the uh, coefficient. And uh, if you run the uh, frequency demand analysis using uh, commercial softwares, and uh, uh, you can uh, get the uh, series of the output, for example, the added mass, the damping, and also uh, the excitation force, and uh, uh, quite a couple of software is going to output the RIOs directly. And uh, so why we are uh, interested in the uh, RIOs? Uh, it's uh, like uh, probably that's the most uh, uh, important parameter for floating structures when you design the offshore floating structures. And uh, here, well, once we know the RIOs for the uh, floating structures, for example, here, uh, this is a typical RIOs for probably for roll motion or uh, pitch motion of some floating structures. Uh, it's a, a, like a narrow banded. And uh, uh, from here, uh, the peak corresponding to the natural frequency of the uh, the motion. And uh, if we have an incident wave like this, and uh, uh, given in the red color, uh, you can see there is no like uh, no wave energy uh, lined up with the uh, RIO range. What you're gonna get on the right hand side. Uh, essentially nothing by linear theory. And uh, if we have waves slightly uh, different uh, frequency range, which overlap with the uh, RIOs, then you're going to have uh, resonant responses for the structure like this. You're going to have uh, uh, you know, the, the green one is the uh, uh, response spectrum. And uh, uh, yeah, why, why we are interested in the response spectrum. So once we know the spectrum, essentially we know uh, all, all the relevant statistics uh, for design. And uh, it's going to be given like the different orders of the uh, uh, moments. Uh, for example, here I listed a couple of uh, um, uh, moments. The, the first M equals zero, uh, M zero, is the zeroth moment, which essentially the area of the uh, response spectrum on the top right corner. And uh, then the, uh, the first um, moment, second moment, and using that, you, you can get different uh, like uh, parameters. Uh, for example, the, if we calculate the uh, zeroth moment and uh, then we can add, we, we can immediately get the uh, significant wave height uh, or significant response value, uh, and also we can add, you know by combination of the zeros and the the second uh, order moment, then we can calculate the the mean uh, period for the response, and that that's essentially the same idea for waves. Um, so this is uh, all about the linear responses. 
and uh, the in reality it's uh, actually uh, uh, nonlinear involved. And uh, so the, now I plotted the, this uh, four boundary value problem. And uh, here, uh, as I had lighted uh, using the red color, that is the uh, where the trouble come from, which is the uh, cross term or the uh, the, the nonlinear term. And, uh, you know, to solve this problem or to consider the nonlinearity, we need to consider all these nonlinear uh, terms. And in the previous, uh, uh, like in the previous, uh, like session, we look at the linear, uh, linear part. And what we do for the linear part is essentially we ignore all the red color here, which is the nonlinear term. And now you can see here as uh, that's this is a uh, the linear problem, where you know we we have another assumption here is uh, um, uh, we assume we know that we are the because uh, for the linear problem we solve the problem at the mean sea level, uh, which is uh, uh, like this, and uh, but in reality, you know if we consider the nonlinearity then all the boundary condition need to be satisfied at the moving water surface rather than the mean sea level. And uh, then, so now if we uh, you know, go one step further to consider the second order, now we, you know, when we calculate the nonlinear uh, boundary value problem, we retain the first and the second order quantities. Like this, the, uh, for example, the very simple one is the first, uh, is the surface elevation. If we only keep the, the linear part and the second harmonics, which is uh, you know, just introduced uh, by here. And then you solve the uh, responses. What we can get is uh, uh, on the bottom side, which is uh, on the lower side of the, the slide. So R uh, represents the uh, response, and uh, you got the components for the linear part. You got the, uh, you know, frequency at at each wave. Uh, for example, here we have two waves at different frequencies uh, to excite the, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, uh, floating body motion, and uh, at, at the linear scope, and uh, you you have two components. One is uh, uh, omega one, uh, it's the frequency of omega one, the other omega two. But if you calculate uh, up to the second order, then you got to uh, have the R two. And uh, we reorganize the uh, equation. Then what we're gonna uh, left there is the, uh, you know, the cost term got cost omega one plus omega two. So that is the sum frequency term. And uh, you, you can see that the dependence is on A1 times A2, which is A squared. That's not A, you know, an, anymore. Uh, but for linear part, that depends on the A, uh, which is a uh, incident wave amplitude. And uh, also we have another term, which is uh, omega one minus omega two, which is a difference term. Because uh, when, when omega one close to omega two give you very low frequency, component, which is a slow drift motion, where, which is very important for like a mooring design. And uh, now I give you uh, 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 like a demonstration of a, a QTF, uh, which covers the, uh, you know, quadratic transfer function to cover the uh, second order physics. And this is a, a QTF. Uh, for the uh, um, uh, lows uh, on the like floating uh, wind turbine. And uh, here on the right hand side, that is the uh, transfer function, uh, linear transfer function, which is, uh, uh, yeah, maybe start from the right hand side. Uh, for the linear one, that is, uh, you know, if we want to calculate the, the lows, then uh, you know, the linear transform function only depends on one incident, uh, uh, one 
um, parameter, which is uh, uh, shown on the right hand side. And uh, but for the uh, 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 quadratic transfer functions or the second order terms, then we have the uh, the transfer function is 2D. So it depends on not only one input parameter, it depends on two input parameters, uh, essentially two incident wave frequency. So the structure is much more complicated. Uh, and this is uh, something about the uh, second order and, and the theory works you know, beyond the second order. We, we can also look at the uh, like the third order interactions, but uh, unfortunately, uh, nobody is able to calculate the third order transfer functions. But in theory, we, we are able to, but nobody dared to see that. Uh, then, and, uh, uh, as I'm going to present that, uh, you know, using the new wave theory, uh, we sort of find a way to uh, estimate or to approximate the uh, higher order harmonics up to the uh, third order or even higher. And um, so the, here are some uh, background on the new wave theory. It's back to the 1990s, uh, which it, uh, so here are some words from a paper uh, written by Mike Actimio and Graham uh, uh, back in back to 1990s. And uh, it says, uh, I improved package uh, for loading analysis of jacket structures uh, have the following requirements. And uh, today we're going to focus on the fourth one, which is uh, a new, more reliable, uh, or more realistic wave kinematics theory. Actually, over the, uh, you know, the, the past decades, and uh, actually uh, updating the theory updated again to reflect the physics more reali uh, realistically. And uh, this can, uh, will be shown in the coming slides. And uh, the definition of the uh, the new wave is uh, actually uh, mentioned by he is uh, the linearized average shape in time of the uh, largest uh, waves uh, in the random say uh, equals the new wave profile and uh, it matches a scaled auto uh, correlation function for the uh, entire time history and, and the provided that the uh, underlying C states follow a linear Gaussian uh, process. And uh, so here, that, that's essentially, uh, you know, the new wave series, uh, like a probability uh, analysis, uh, it, it provide very, uh, like, efficient way to estimate the extremes. Because we know if we look at the time histories, it's uh, very time consuming. To save time, we look at the problem at like frequency demand, uh, which is much quicker. And here that's essentially a, a probability demand analysis. So which can be much you know, super quicker. And uh, uh, yeah, as mentioned, this has like a mathematic uh, uh, support or theory to support this assumption or this theory, and this picture shows the uh, the, the the all the relevant people in this slide, um, and uh, that is uh, just uh, outside UW, the uh, Swan River, much of the big kitchen, and uh, yeah, so here are some uh, equations. For the uh, uh, you know to demonstrate how the new wave is linked to the uh, irregular waves, and uh, the on the on the top that is the uh, like a wave surface elevation. Uh, uh, you, you, we can uh, describe as irregular wave surface elevation in this equation. And uh, the new wave profile essentially uh, just uh, restructured the uh, the equation, and uh, you, you know the uh, then the amplitude is scaled by the uh, standard deviation or the variance, and uh, uh, here the 
you know, the reform of this, uh, uh, like a conventional uh, expression has led to very significant benefits in the uh, data analysis. And uh, I'm gonna uh, go a little bit further with this, uh, um, with this equation. So the, you know, uh, following on that, uh, the previous slides and uh, if we look at the uh, the equation and then remove, you know, in the previous slides, uh, if you look at the uh, the second equation uh, on the uh, uh, for the exponential term, and uh, we have random or uh, random phase, and and uh, if all the wave components. Um, if we force the, all the wave components into the same phase, yeah, at the same location, so essentially we're going to have the new wave crest, which is this equation. Um, and uh, the the beauty of the this uh, equation is, you can see the uh, the amplitude of the new wave uh, crest is set by a one in n largest uh, event. And uh, you can calculate that using this uh, equation. For example, the alpha equals uh, uh, this term, and uh, the uh, sigma is the uh, standard deviation uh, for the uh, state states. And uh, on the uh, you know the coefficient two uh, times log n, it, that associated with the duration of the uh, the state states. And uh, if we have longer duration for the state states, we're gonna have more waves, and then we have larger uh, and larger number of waves, which is a larger n, and then they give us larger amplitude. And if you you know the other, we are uh, you know likewise. And uh, yeah, so and the benefits of the new wave uh, is just like uh, essentially. Then you will bring the information from like a three hour random state state into a very short time window. For example, maybe uh, like 20 seconds or 30 seconds, something like that. And uh, to give you a like um, a clear idea of how we can link these two. So this is a uh, irregular uh, wave time histories. And uh, what we're going to do is we divided that into a few, uh, a couple of beams, and at each, uh, within each beam, you pick up the largest value, and uh, then, and uh, we bring, we you know like we mentioned, we force the uh, the waves out at the same time, like this, and then we average the uh, the very short time window, and uh, what we're going to get. This is the, the average the shape of the uh, large event, which is the uh, new view profile. And uh, uh, then, you know, using this uh, uh, methodology, uh, and then we uh, can uh, um, play around with more tricks. For example, the phase decomposition methodology, they, this uh, gives us uh, like, um, uh, more opportunities to uh, do something uh, essentially uh, impossible using a conventional methodology. And uh, here, um, first we look at the new wave crest, we, which is shown before. And uh, uh, if we look at the face information, if uh, all the components, uh, like if you add the like 180 degree to all the wave components, you can have a crust, a trust, a trough, uh, which is the other way around, uh, invert of the crest. And uh, so the, uh, why are we gonna do this? Because uh, if you look at the bottom um, equation, uh, for, uh, we, we understand for like uh, uh, Stokes type uh, nonlinear waves, we, now we look at the first two, uh, terms uh, and it can be uh, much higher order. So the first term is uh, a times a cos omega t, which is uh, the linear term 
and then the second harmonics is uh, which is uh, uh, you know a small parameter times uh, which is the uh, st steepness of the waves and uh, times the uh, uh, e squared and then cos omega t times t uh, to omega t and uh, then if we look at these two terms and uh, here so uh, I highlight the different components using different colors. One is the uh, uh, blue color, and the other is the, the second harmonic in red. And uh, if we look at the bottom left hand side, that is the uh, uh, new wave signal, and it contains. Uh, uh, here we only look at the first two harmonics. If you uh, break down the harmonics, the blue one is the uh, linear component and the red one is the second harmonic. So if we look at the uh, uh, frequency component, uh, which is shown on the top right corner, we can see the spectrum shows some overlapping over the frequencies. So if we want to do a, like a digital filtering to separate the two harmonics, it's impossible here because of the overlapping uh, of the frequency. So what, what we can do here is uh, we do the like, like we use exactly the same signal in, in the wave basin and then uh, do the uh, phase invert uh, inversion and then uh, what we're going to get is like the uh, uh, the black dashed line and uh, if we add the two together and then the uh, the linear part will be uh, uh, disappearing so we only left the second harmonics and if we use the first one minus the second one, then the second harmonic will be uh, will disappear, and then we only left the linear component. So, you know, using this methodology, we, we can get the different harmonics. And by the same uh, uh, analogy, if we run uh, waves at different uh, phases, like here we have. Uh, uh, like these uh, four phases uh, with intervals at 90 degrees rather than 180 and do the uh, combination of the different signals, essentially we can get the, the first four harmonics. And here, this is an example of uh, the signals we get in the uh, wave basin. And on the left hand side, uh, each different color have the, uh, the responses at different uh, uh, with different uh, face input. And we, if we do the combination and then we get the right hand side, which is, uh, uh, you know, the, the different color on the right hand side representing the different harmonics. Yeah. And uh, by this, if, if we, again, to come back to the spectrum, uh, you can see here, um, it allows us to identify up to the 14 harmonics signal, uh, which is uh, quite surprisingly. And uh, then based on that, we have conditioning analysis, which allow us to find out the uh, internal relationship between the uh, input and the uh, uh, responses. But here, I don't think I'm gonna go into the details. Here, you know, you know we have two uh, different, uh, one is the black curve is the uh, the input signal and the red one is the responses. If we land the, them together in time, and uh, again, we look at each beam, uh, each beams and uh, then average them, what we can get is the, you know, we can get the most probable maximum response, uh, which is the red color. And correspondingly, the uh, the blue uh, the the black color on the bottom, which is uh, associated with the reason why you know, how we gonna we we drive the response, and uh, then we can do the other way around, and and then so this this is to show the um, reciprocity of the the whole system. This is a uh, details. So now we jump 
jump to the uh, last uh, session of the uh, about the design of waves. You know, using the ideas uh, in the previous slides, we we can identify what kind of uh, the waves produce the uh, largest responses. Because uh, in, in the design, we are not only interested in the most a probable largest response, but also we wanted to understand what kind of waves can induce such uh, responses. And uh, here, this is an example for uh, like uh, this is an M4 wave energy converter and uh, some testing uh, done by Harry. And uh, I just took some results uh, here on the. Uh, so from here, we can uh, identify the uh, uh, one in n waves with uh, the new wave shape, which is uh, given in the uh, uh, like a black color on the top figure, and then the corresponding uh, response is the red is the red curve, and uh, then we find out the new response. Uh, essentially, the same idea um, for the response. And uh, then we can find out the what kind of the uh, the waves produce the largest response. And uh, um, yeah, so actually, if you look at the uh, the red curve on the uh, um, on the top and the black curve on the uh, the bottom one, they have very similar shape, but the uh, uh, like opposite side um, or uh, with respect to the uh, uh, the central line, and uh, again, that is a reciprocity uh, demonstrating the linear system. And uh, yeah, to wrap up, um, we covered the uh, basis for linear and uh, nonlinear wave structure interactions, uh, focusing on the RIOs, which is a linear transform function, and then the uh, QTFs. And uh, then the uh, uh, new wave analysis, which is a prob uh, uh, probability uh, analysis, demand analysis, which is quicker compared to the uh, frequency demand analysis and uh, also much quicker than the uh, time demand analysis. And the finally, uh, I demonstrate we can use the uh, uh, this methodology to derive the uh, um, to drive the uh, design of waves. And uh, the design of waves is only a small portion of time history. And uh, we can see the strong benefits uh, when we do the physical model testing in the tank and also do CFD simulations because uh, it's, you know, for CFD simulations, it's very time consuming. And uh, if we can run like, a, um, like 20 seconds rather than uh, you know, three hours, that makes things much uh, achievable. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm gonna stop here. And uh, if uh, any questions, uh, oh yeah, Dimitri. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the, um, that that that's true. It's not been widely uh, used in design uh, at the moment, but the uh, I think uh, uh, some classification societies uh, are talking about using this, uh, putting this into the design guidelines. Probably, uh, Paul, are, are you there? Maybe you would like to offer some comments on that. Uh, I, I'm, I am here, but I didn't hear the question, so perhaps you could repeat it. Uh, yeah, so the, 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 the question is, uh, you know, current design is still based on like a frequency demand analysis, uh, or which is uh, in the design guidelines. And uh, 
for example, for new project, why uh, uh, we would like to use the new view analysis. Uh, Dimitri, is that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, well, why it's not widely used uh, or uh, in the design? I think that's, I think that's a good question. Um, a trivial response is that nobody's read our papers, but um, more um, sensible response is simply that the industry is relatively conservative. And actually for linear systems, you prob you'll get pretty much the same answer. So there's not an enormous advantage in shifting over to a design wave approach. The design wave approach really wins when the system responses are nonlinear. Uh, thank you for answer. And can you give like examples of um, uh, maybe floating facilities or maybe particular environments around the world where these nonlinear effects will be very important and where this design wave approach uh, should be used in lieu of our standard linear approaches? I think that's what the rest of the session's about. Um, <laughs> we've got uh, four or five different examples coming up, I guess, Dimitri. I mean, maybe maybe we should return to that um, later on. Um, I don't know if you had any comment, Paul or Leafen, but we have, do have a number of examples coming up between now and the end. No, I'd agree with that. Um, please, please listen to the next couple of mini talks and you should see some nice examples where nonlinearity turns out to be rather important. Yep. Okay, so we, is that, that uh, all good? We, I mean, we can probably fit in another, an example before dinner, um, because, yeah, that, I guess pretty heavy. I guess we sort of, everyone's seen lots of equations describing new wave now, so don't, don't forget those. Uh, Bash you overhead with that for a bit, but now it's basically everything from here on will have an application. So it, it, we're just going to go through a bunch of different structures and apply this. So when I talked about different loading regimes, right, big structures, diffraction, smaller structures, inertia loads, and then even smaller structures, slender structures, um, viscous drag load dominated structures. So we'll start off with something dominated by viscous drag load, so jackets. Um, before dinner, you always have to put on your jacket. Um, that, that was just for Scott. Um, <laughs> So, but anyway, we'll just talk briefly about jackets and we've got some, some bigger diffracting structures to talk about afterwards and then some um, more sort of floating and fixed wind structures after the break. So this is um, um, actually not work from the hub, it's stuff that Paul's been doing elsewhere, but we sort, we'd sort of bring in a variety of different examples to sort of flesh out what you're talking about, Dimitri. How can we use wave groups um, in different contexts to take advantage of, of their characteristics and do better wave structure interaction um, better than, than is standard. Um, so this is so it's just jackets, um, jacket loads in, in waves and current. So um, what are the issues for, for jackets? Obviously, um, in general, it's undesirable for the waves to hit the deck of the jacket, um, but it, it, obviously you can't exclude that possibility from happening. There's, there's some probability that, that the wave will hit the deck. So that's one issue. But then there's also the, the forces on the jacket in waves and current. Um, and that should account for the fact that the, the jacket being there changes the flow through the jacket, so a blockage effect. If you use the undisturbed wave and current kinematics, um, you don't do a good job of estimating those loads. Um, and can you have those together? Can you take account of structural motion of the jacket while this loading is happening, as opposed to just considering it to be a static fixed structure? So these are questions you might be interested in for jackets. And you might be interested in jackets for um, traditional offshore. Um, they're now winter floating, uh, not floating, but fixed wind turbines being mounted on jackets as well as the substations. Um, the, the legs of jack ups look like this a bit. So there are a bunch of applications. So um, just briefly going back to um, kinematics of, of, of crests. So this is the famous. Um, Draupner wave measured in the North Sea um, in 1995. So crest height 18.3 metres. So crest height above mean sea level 18.3 metres when the significant wave height was only 12 metres. So 
so very, very large wave. Um, but new wave um, reproduces the shape of that extreme wave and the bound harmonics quite well. Um, so new wave for, for air gap, so for the jacket, the air gap problem, obviously, the new wave and how high a crest will get um, is, is very important. Uh, but the, the trick is that you can't make this wave, if we've showed before, long crested and spread C examples of, of focused groups. You can't make this wave with long crested examples. It, it just um, sort of falls apart before it gets there. So you have to have uh, crossing Cs um, to get the structure of the, the bound components right and to get sort of water up to the right level. So you can focus, um, you can focus in space, but have long crested waves, like I showed before. So all the crests are parallel, or you can have focused at a single point where um, they're crossing. So I'm not, by focused, I mean potentially both. But in this case, you can only do. You have to, you have to have energy coming from different directions. So it has to be a directionally focused group to, to get to get water up high enough to make this wave, which was recorded in the field. So the re, the lab recreation is what's shown in the bottom. Um, from that tank that I failed to play a video from before. Uh, and, and, and the draft and wave, yeah, there's a note here. So it was an unambiguous record because of actually some minor damages, as you might be aware. Um, so, so going back to the, the loads on the jacket structure. Um, so I said that the, the flow through the jacket is modified. Um, because the jacket's there. So if you use the undisturbed kinematics, then you don't get a good estimate of the load. So um, it would be good to be able to, to reproduce that in, in CFD. Um, and then we can run wave groups in CFD with wave and current and then get a good estimate of the loads. Um, but it's not uh, desirable to represent every stick in the jacket structure in CFD because they spend all day building the mesh. So you, you represent it as, as porous blocks. Um, so this is looking down on top of the of a representation of a jacket structure. Um, and so the flow is from left to right. So I guess maybe I can point. Um, so this is a plot of, of the pressure field. So pressures rise ahead of the jacket and, and drops behind. Um, this is the velocity. So there's a big wake behind the jacket. As the flow through has been modified. Um, this is the the so this is the streamwise velocity. So the flow is going that way. So it's the lateral velocity. So flow is being forced around the jacket. So it's, it's blocking the flow. Um, and here we see the the vorticity. So it's showing a wake. So so open foam. Um, the CFD package uh, models the way the jacket um, affects the flow through it, uh, even without resolving the details of each individual member. So you can just represent it as a as porous. Um, sheets or, or blocks which which provide resistance to the flow um, and, and those are meant, meant to represent you know these parts of the of the frame structure so this is um, testing that was done in uh, the Kelvin towing tank in Glasgow um, and you can see the jacket model so this is a, a jacket with with rises on the inside and, and then structure um, the, uh, the scales one to eighty of a, of a real jacket, but an anonymous jacket, um, and it's supported on a moving carriage. So waves are created at one end of the tank and propagate down the tank, and the current is created by dragging the jacket along from the top. And there's a sophisticated arrangement to ensure that um, you get good measurement of of the forces. And and there's also some tricks about um, how the wave and current are, are synchronized. Um, but so to do that, if you have that arrangement, then then you can send a wave group in, and and because the jacket's travelling along, it already has the has the current effectively, um, and you can have wave and current loads um, simultaneously. So the top one is the measurement in black of of the the horizontal force on the jacket, um, the total, and and the CFD reproduction is in red. So again, so for for wave and current loads. We're getting a really good reproduction, um, and the bottom plot just shows that split into into low and high frequencies. Um, and so it does a very good job, except for 
maybe small BOV loads on the on the slightly larger vertical members, but um, perhaps that's quibbling from a design point of view. You'd be pretty happy. Um, and then you can actually go a bit deeper and try and embed um, the new waves in a, in a random regular background. In a, in a regular background, so so here the the wave time history is a, a new wave. And the background C state is, is a regular wave um, but with small current. So we have various um, various test cases here. Um, but the, the important point is again, the measurements are in black and the, the CFD is in red. So, so take, again, take advantage of, of wave groups. Um, the, and the color is on the right hand side, the colors. Oh, there's colors showing up not particularly well, but, but the, the measurements black and then the uh, calculations accounting for the blockage are in are in gray and calculations using the undisturbed kinematics are in red. And, and what you notice is if you account for blockage, you use the same drag coefficient for all cases. If you don't account for blockage, you can get the same answer. You just have to change your drag coefficient each time. Um, <laughs> which, I mean, I guess drag coefficients are a bit like that. But the point is that the, that, uh, the recipe accounting for blockage gives you a sort of universal formula for, for calculating the jacket loads, um, which we can validate using these high quality wave group experiments and in CFD to get, I guess, the full recipe for, for jacket loads in wave and current. Um, and then one of the additional points um, of interest is what is the effect of jacket dynamics? So in these cases, there are three different curves um, on the plot. So black is, is a static model. Um, and the red is um, a, a model with a spring applied. So it has a, a resonant frequency of the, of the structure. And the blue is a different resonant frequency. So the blue is a resonant frequency 2.4 times the peak wave frequency, and the red is, is 1.9. Um, and the what you see is that actually, if you have um, uh, account for the flexibility of the structure, then actually the loads, uh, loads go down. Um, and this can be accounted for um, if you include relative velocity Morrison loads in in the calculation. So um, that what matters is not just the um, velocity of the fluid relative to the, where the structure was initially, but the velocity of the fluid relative to where the structure is as it's moving. And so the velocity of the fluid relative to the, the moving structure. Um, and, and the nature of that interaction is that, that that actually provides some damping so that the, the structure can move, um, but its vibrations actually will be, will be strongly damped by having the flow faster. Um, and again, um, this can be done on the right hand side um, with CFD as well as experimentally in the tank with, with very good success. So, so that's a bunch of um, new web applications to loads on the, the structure of the jacket. But then we might also be interested, we said new is very good at getting water up high um, to hit the deck. So this is a, a, a a deck impact case. So the deck actually looks like it's shown at the bottom. So it's a, a um, cross hatch structure of, of I beams. And so um, obviously the, the, the scenario is that the wave gets up high enough to, to whack the bottom of the deck um, and cause very large loads. And so this has been um, tested in the same facility. And also um, quite ambitiously tested in CFD. So you, you can probably just about see um, that there are individual representations of the, the I-beams there. And so this is a, a, a focused wave group coming through and impacting the bottom of the deck and, and the, the side as well a little bit and propagating along and sort of getting caught in each of these individual compartments. Um, and again, experiments in black and numerics in red. So there are a lot of um, 
big spikes um, in the experiments there. Um, and the spikes aren't necessarily replicated, but if you if you filter it out for the for the low pass force, I guess, which is contributing to the dominant sort of impulse on the structure, then the, the um, CFD and the experiments do a really good job of, of capturing. So that sort of impulse is delivered to the structure from this deck impact. Um, and I, I guess, you know, if we go back to why we use focus wave groups, you know, there'll be sort of no point in doing this with a regular wave, right? You don't want a wave that's coming along. It's not realistic to have a regular wave come along and hit the deck every time for 10 crests in a row. There's sort of no real value in, in doing that, but we can do this short compact simulation and, and, and measure the impact here and, and get a really good comparison. So uh, in conclusion, wave and current blockage matter for the loads on the structure of the jacket. Um, and the standard recipes, to go back to Dimitri's question, don't currently account for that, but probably should and hopefully will in future. Um, and, and this can be done in CFD, not by resolving the structure, but just by representing it as, as a, a block, a porous block, um, applying force to the flow. Um, we can account for structural dynamics if that's important for the particular jacket. Uh, we can do wave and deck loads, taking advantage of the of the properties of wave groups to, to get a really nice compact simulation of that. Um, and there's been extensive validation of this. So, and this has been work done at UWA, but mostly at Oxford, NUS, TCOMs in Glasgow um, by Harris Santo, Yu Sung Chu, and, and Sandy Day. A lot of that work. So that's um, the end of example one of using wave groups to look at structures. So after dinner, we'll look at um, uh, large structures with small gap in between them, um, uh, large, stru large structures, uh, scattering waves, um, and also at, at fixed columns that support offshore wind turbines as well as uh, novel um, floating offshore wind turbines, and then have a bit of a wrap up. Um, so hopefully, yeah, it'll just get more interesting, more different structures. Um, and yeah, I guess dinner time, unless there are any questions. Can I ask a question? You said that you can in CFD you can model the structure with a series of porous members. How do you go about defining and determining that? I mean, what's that? That sounds like a complex process to me. Yeah. <laughs> How do you know so, so the question I'll, I'll repeat, Paul, so you can hear. The, the question is, how do you define the the porous block? Um, but I mean, while but Paul jump in if you if you want to say something, but I mean, I guess you. Um, I mean, you have, you have the details of the, of the structure, right? I mean, we're talking about um, future um, testing with with the structure and removing the uh, removing the, the rises from the inside. So um, I don't know how sensitive it actually is to the um, the choice you make on the on the on the individual grids. Um, but the um, I guess you can calibrate um, against one test. I think would probably be one way to do it. I mean, if if you have a new build structure um, and you haven't done any calibration, uh, I guess you can probably estimate that from. I mean, the loads of an individual, you know. It's made up of standard members, which we understand, I guess, that the drag coefficients for. Um, so I think you can probably estimate that from the ground up, but I don't know if Paul might have a better answer. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, once you know the members, the dimensions of each member, you know the frontal area, uh, and then you associate a drag coefficient with that. If it's a cylinder, a smooth cylinder, then you might take a CD of 0.8. If it's got marine growth on it, you might take a CD of one in the field. Um, and that's essentially the drag for that element. You take the number of elements within the block representation and just average out what's effectively frontal area, total frontal area divided by, uh, multiplied by drag coefficient, divided by the frontal area of the block. And then that gives you an equivalent drag coefficient for the block. Um, I mean, what we did worry about when we did the analysis was whether or not we should have two blocks, one 
that has a very high density where the, all the risers are and a second uh, embedded within a second block which had less loading due to just the structural members. But actually, we discovered it didn't really matter how, how, quite how you do it. It's rather insensitive to that choice. So essentially, just assume that the total jacket is filled with foam and smear out all the structural area producing drag across that foam. And how, how sensitive is it to the to the drag coefficient? Um, it's less sensitive than you might expect, because if you put in a higher drag coefficient, you get more blockage. So, you know, for example, in the in the lab tests, we had a, an effective drag coefficient of 1.3, which sounds high for a cylinder, but for ease of construction of the model, all the horizontals in the model were, were uh, square cross section members. It was only the diagonals and verticals that were cylindrical tubes. So having an average CD of 1.3 is perfectly reasonable at lab scale for that. In the field, one would expect to choose a CD of, of say, one, which would account for some marine growth on the members. Yeah, I don't know that. The Paul, what, yeah, um, how significant are the it, current it, codes? It, Did you hear that? In, in the original days before current blockage, uh, it just just blocking the current. So if you got say a one meter a second approach current and you do a current blockage calculation, then effectively you use a current of maybe 0.7 meters a second, so 30% reduction. Um, so going from no blockage to current blockage on a typical application might save you 40% of load, including some wave blockage as well, um, will potentially take you down by another 20%. It's very structure specific, and obviously the magnitude of the current affects everything. But the jacket loads, I mean, my belief is that the jacket loads using the recipe that's in ISO and API at the moment is still significantly over conservative. Yeah, so welcome back. And uh, we're going to go through another application for large uh, volume structure uh, um, with uh, a gap in between two large volume structures. And uh, uh, we're going to focus on the gap resonance phenomenon between two uh, floating structures here. And the reason for that is uh, it's quite an interesting uh, phenomenon. And uh, if I show you this video, you, you can see what's, uh, what may occur inside uh, 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 a gap between two vessels. And uh, you know, for the strong resonant uh, water motions inside of the gap, actually the uh, the waves, uh, the background waves are very uh, mild C states. And uh, for this scenario, it covers like the multi floating body interactions and uh, also the multi resonant modes. And uh, for this scenario, because of the vessels are very close to each other, and the waves, once trapped inside of the gap, it's hard to escape. So the radiation damping is small. And uh, in that scenario, for resonance systems, uh, the uh, viscous uh, damping becomes also uh, important. So essentially, this problem covers pretty much you know, all the in interesting hydrodynamic phenomena in wave structure interactions. So we uh, conducted a series of experiments, uh, model scale testing uh, in the basin in Shanghai Jiaotong University. And we simplify the problem into uh, two rectangular boxes. And uh, this is a snapshot of the uh, model in the wave basin. And uh, uh, the, the wave basin is 50 meters long and 40 meters wide. Uh, the water depth for this testing was uh, 10 meter. And uh, uh, 
Yeah, so this is uh, uh, some uh, uh, demonstration of the experimental setup. And uh, here we focus on the uh, like uh, the gap residence. So the first step, we fixed the body in the wheel basin, uh, you know, for small for small scale uh, uh, scaled model, we have uh, facilities strong enough to hold the vessel in the waves. And uh, so in in the uh, testing, we use the uh, transient wave group, which is a new wave type input waves uh, shown on the top left corner. And uh, this type of wave group pass through the uh, vessels uh, in a two side by side configuration. And uh, then we have the wave gauge in the center of the gap. Uh, this is the on the bottom right corner. That is the uh, the opt port, which which is given in a red color. If you look at the input under the opt port, it's, uh, the input is very clean, uh, like a structure, which is a focus wave group, and the the response or the opt port is a very complicated structure. Got a, a strong baiting pattern. Uh, this is a, a superposition of the different vibration mode. And uh, when uh, and when we talk about the vibration mode uh, inside of the gap, uh, this is a dem uh, illustration of that. If we uh, we have one multiple mode excited in the gap, the first mode is a, a half sine wave uh, along the gap. Uh, it's shown like the uh, the green curve here, and uh, then we have other higher mode excited like this way, uh, shown as the uh, uh, the red curve, which is uh, three half wavelengths uh, along the gap, because uh, this this is a very symmetric setup, and the, also the uh, excitation from beam side on. So we only have the symmetric mode, which means uh, at the end of the gap, that's pretty much zero. Or, and uh, in the middle, we have strong resonance. And uh, uh, we also have other mode excited like the uh, uh, M equal two mode, which is uh, uh, like a two half sine wave uh, or um, one sine wave. And, uh, but that, that is for other heading conditions. But here we are focused on the BMC, and uh, then I'm gonna give this uh, video to demonstrate what, what is the mode should look like, and uh, th this is essentially a video to show you if you oscillate holding the two end of a string and oscillate that up and down, uh, what's gonna happen? I'm not gonna do that by myself, but this is uh, a video for the. Like a machine to oscillate the uh, two end of a string, and uh, if you have different frequency at the two end, and then you can excite the different vibration mode. And in the gap, essentially we have a superposition of a series of this vibration mode uh, for the free surface elevations. And uh, as I said, we put a wave gauge in the middle of the uh, the the gap. Uh, essentially, we are marrying the the, uh, the largest response for each gap mode, because uh, for each gap mode, for the symmetric gap mode, we got the maximum value at the middle of the the gap. So we analyze the uh, the input with uh, spectrum and uh, the response spectrum. We we plot them on top of each other on the top right corner. And the blue curve is the uh, uh, input wave energy, and uh, the red one is the response. And uh, you can see the different uh, this, the uh, spikes in the red curve. That is uh, corresponding to each uh, resonant mode in the gap. And uh, uh, in the engineering design, we're going to do like uh, divide the red curve by the blue one. Uh, so essentially, we divide the uh, the response by the input wave. So what we're going to have is the uh, RIOs, the, the linear transfer function. 
and this the this is given in the dots uh, uh, for the experimental results and uh, then we uh, will ask can we predict this uh, through numerical modeling and uh, then this is a numerical simulations and you can see here we catch the uh, uh, frequency quite nicely but the uh, for the response amplitude and uh, the numerical model has uh, uh, significantly overestimated the response amplitude. The reason for that is, uh, uh, as, as you can guess, uh, this is a linear potential flow calculations, and essentially we ignored the viscous effect. And we mentioned in the beginning for this resonant phenomenon, both radiation damping and the viscous damping will be important. So. The next step, we're going to look at the, the viscous stamping. And uh, here it may might show the benefits of using the constant wave group. Um, and on the top, that, that is the input wave group. And this wave uh, time history pass through the, um, uh, the two side-by-side -side vessels. And uh, then the bottom one is the uh, response. And we lined up the input signal and the response signal uh, in time. And uh, at time equal seven seconds, as you can see from here, there is no input with energy to the system, but we still have very strong uh, uh, resonant signals for the given in the red color. And up to 30 seconds, we expect some waves reflected from the, the, the tank walls. And uh, so in that case, um, uh, from then on, the uh, signal will be contaminated by the uh, reflections. But from the like time equals seven seconds to 30 seconds, and essentially we don't have any input energy and also we don't have any contamination. So this is a pure decay process. And uh, uh, now we look at the this uh, like uh, uh, time sig uh, signals, and uh, this is uh, uh, a pure decay signals. And we mentioned previously, it, it's a couple of uh, like uh, gap resonance, uh, and for each gap resonance mode, that's a half sign signals, and. Uh, so for this process, that's, that should be a series of decaying sinusoidal signals, because that's a pure decay curve. And uh, now I break down that signal uh, into the uh, following four components, and each one is a decaying sinusoidal signal. And uh, the frequency, each frequency corresponding to the net to the natural frequency of the gap modes. And uh, uh, what I'm going to do is, is to show you how these uh, breakdowns can reconstruct the uh, total signal measured in the middle of the, uh, the, the gap. And the first one is the M equal one mode. And compared with the total signal, you can see the, the difference between the, uh, the red curve and the, uh, the blue one. If we add the uh, M equal one mode and the uh, M equal three, which is a three half sine wave plus one half sine wave. And then you can see slightly uh, better. And then if we also include the M equal five mode, uh, getting there, and then the seven mode, and then that's essentially uh, the same, um, the, the same uh, curves. And uh, you know this whole process is uh, a simple sum of the signals, so that that's a linear process. And we understand for the radiation damping, that is the uh, uh, you know from a linear potential flow calculation, so it must be linear as well. And then the remaining part will be the viscous damping here. So that means the uh, viscous damping must be. Uh, linear as well. And uh, then this is uh, something uh, quite uh, 
uh, important uh, observations. Because uh, if the risk stamping is also have a linear performance, then that makes uh, calculations much easier. And uh, uh, this is uh, like a uh, you know indirect uh, demonstration or uh, support of the linear uh, risk stamping. And uh, then we run the CFD simulations uh, to reproduce the, the experiments. And uh, here uh, you can see what's going on inside of the gap. That you can see the uh, like the the various uh, surface structures, which is the superposition of the different uh, gap modes. And uh, the the main message from this CFD simulation is the we have the flow field, and then by analyzing the flow field, and we confirm that's. Uh, a Stokes uh, lambda boundary layer, and which has the uh, linear uh, behavior, and uh, yeah, so th this kind of a, uh, like a twenty second uh, CFD uh, movie uh, took about uh, one month to calculate uh, in a super uh, computer, uh, and uh, you know in the lab it took uh, like uh, a. 20 seconds to collect the data, but uh, numerically, uh, it took us uh, a month to reproduce only one case. And, but we got the direct uh, um, evidence of the linear risk stamping. Then we uh, use the uh, linear risk uh, stamping to, uh, you know, put into the different softwares developed by uh, uh, different uh, uh, companies. Um, and uh, uh, here uh, we use the software from BMW, from BV and uh, LR, and uh, uh, each different uh, solid curve with different color represents the uh, calculations from the different uh, uh, softwares. And uh, you can see all the different col uh, solid curves agree quite well with the experimental data. And uh, then, you know, uh, once we get the RIOs or the linear transfer function and uh, use that, we can uh, um, uh, use the uh, linear transfer function to obtain the design waves. Uh, which is uh, shown on the uh, on these slides, and uh, first we we can produce the uh, you know the new wave for the input waves, and uh, then we we can also like uh, produce the uh, uh, the new wave type form for the response. We, here we call it the new response, which is shown in the blue uh, color here, and uh, then so. What caused the uh, the blue color, which is uh, the design wave shown in the red uh, in the green color, and you can see that's uh, like uh, uh, it's a quite a different uh, different time histories, uh, or not that's not so intuitive if you look only look at the uh, output or uh, or the response, and uh, yeah, so. This is uh, uh, something about the uh, how we're going to use the RIOs to analyze the design waves and also the uh, most probable response. And uh, here, actually, uh, the uh, the purple uh, the uh, the pink curve is the uh, the response curve. Uh, if you have a red curve, it's an input. And uh, you, you can see the, the, the pink curve is, is like uh, symmetric with the uh, green curve. That now I just uh, flip that over so you can see that they agree quite well. So that, that's a strong demonstration of the reciprocity of the, the linear system. And the, using that, because here we can use the uh, like um, 
the this theory to calculate the most probable response at various locations along the gap. So what we did is we used the RIOs uh, extracted from the experiment to calculate the most probable response um, along the gap. And uh, here, uh, each uh, hollow dot represents the uh, results we get from the experimental results. And uh, then the solid curve is the RIOs, which is uh, um, calculated using potential flow theory without introducing any artificial damping. And uh, that, you know, the two curves give us the, uh, like uh, the most probable response, uh, probable largest response along the gap. And uh, the bounded area give us the uh, confidence uh, on, because, uh, uh, you, you know, the, uh, the experimental results give us like uh, uh, the uh, per predictions at model scale using the viscous damping. But at the uh, field, the the flow field will be different with the uh, with the uh, uh, tank testing, because the Reynolds number will be quite different. In the lab, it's like a ten power. The uh, Reynolds number is ten power four, and uh, uh, in the field, it could be uh, up to ten power six, uh, or even higher. And uh, so the idea we produce these two curves is. Uh, uh, so the experimental results represents the uh, the largest uh, viscous damping we're gonna input to the model, and then the uh, linear potential flow calculation without any artificial damping represents upper boundary, because uh, then the uh, full scale uh, the viscous damping at full scale must be sitting in between the two curves, so that give us some like a uh, uh, prediction confidence for the full scale uh, performance. And this results uh, has been published in the uh, uh, ocean engineering paper and uh, then uh, incorporated in the uh, new guideline developed uh, by uh, Lloyd's Register at the end of 2019. And also, uh, you know, the collaboration contributing to the the new tide, and uh, for the for this uh, previous slide, we have been focusing on uh, linear excitation, and uh, that is, uh, you know, the dashed line here, uh, suggesting the uh, uh, the natural frequency for the gap modes at full scale uh, at six, uh, which is seven seconds, and then our incident wave is also lined up with that one, which is a seven second wave. And uh, not surprisingly, we get very strong uh, resonant motions in the gap. And uh, on the right hand side, that is the breakdown of the components. And then the, the question is, uh, uh, the gap uh, natural frequency is still seven seconds. And if we have a swell at 14 seconds, approach the uh, uh, side by side config uh, vessel. What, what's going to happen? Uh, by linear theory, we understand in the previous slides it's going to be zero. But uh, through the second order um, uh, nonlinear interactions, uh, this is what we measured from the the lab. You can see we have very strong resonant motions uh, at the uh, like uh, uh, gap resonance mode. And then we break down that and look at the uh, uh, harmonics. On the uh, bottom right corner, that is the uh, breakdown of the uh, response. The blue one is the linear response, and the red one is the uh, second harmonic. So now the second harmonic is uh, comparable to the linear component. Uh, but for the uh, like uh, offshore hydrodynamics, typically the second order is uh, much smaller compared to the linear component. But here that's comparable. And uh, out of interest, in, we also have like a 21 second wave approach the, uh, uh, the two vessels. And uh, 
then you can see here, we got the uh, breakdown on the bottom right corner and the uh, grain curve is the uh, third harmonic. So now you can see uh, through this setup, the uh, third harmonic uh, is, you know, significant third harmonic is driven through the uh, frequency tripling. And, uh, you know, for this process, we understand, you know, for the linear excitation, that's quite straightforward. We have a linear transfer function times the one input parameter, which is the one uh, wave frequency, then you got the output. And for the uh, second harmonic response, we have a quadratic transfer function. And uh, then we need to combine with two input parameters. And uh, the good thing is we can still calculate the QTF uh, uh, transfer functions. But for the cubic one, it's uh, the kind of, uh, uh, yeah, very challenging. And then we look at the, uh, the, uh, the structure of the uh, uh, QTFs, because we can calculate the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, quadratic transfer functions using numerical model. And what we found here is uh, the, the QTF has uh, like uh, a flat form um, in the uh, perpendicular direction to the leading diagonal. So uh, that means probably you can see from this 3D plot in, in one direction, which is uh, uh, flat, uh, across the different uh, uh, the different uh, grids, and uh, that that means you we don't necessarily need to calculate the full matrix. We only need to can calculate the um, the yeah the uh, like uh, variables at the leading diagonal, and then you stretch that or just uh, equal that value to other places in the perpendicular direction. So that saves loads of uh, calculation efforts. And uh, to, to demonstrate that we use the uh, like a flat QTF uh, assumption and uh, to calculate the second order response. And on the right con uh, on the right hand side, uh, one of the uh, curve is measured from the, the basin. The other is calculated based on the uh, like uh, the flat QTF assumption. So you can see we have a very good uh, 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 agreement. And uh, by the same uh, analogy, actually we can only calculate, we are able to calculate the sub cubic transfer function by calculating the leading diagonal. So don't need to calculate the, uh, you know, for the, for the Q QTF that's 3D already for, the cubic one, we're going to introduce another axis for the input. I don't know what, what it looked like. And, uh, but now we can uh, uh, achieve that by this approximation. So that the previous slide shows the uh, gap resonance with the uh, body fixed. Now we come to the uh, real problem, which is uh, when the body is floating, so what, what's going to happen? And uh, again, we are using the same uh, model, but we allow one of the model to uh, uh, freely floating um, uh, under the excitation of the waves. And uh, the setup is like this. And uh, on the right, you know, the, uh, the, uh, from the diagram, um, the right-hand side vessel is fixed, and uh, then the other one is uh, six degree floating. And we compared, we used the same uh, incident wave uh, to excite the, uh, the, the responses. And uh, we get the uh, output as uh, like the bottom right corner. That if you look at the two curves, the black curve is the floating, but here we're still presenting the gap resonance in the middle. And the red curve is the, uh, with the two boxes fixed. And then the uh, black one is uh, for the floating one. 
So that's something surprised us because uh, we thought the uh, floating, when the body is floating, it's going to uh, absorb some wave energy. And uh, then the gap resonance may be smaller. But actually, due to the body motion, we get even bigger gap resonance response. So when the body is floating, the gap resonance can be two times bigger as that it is uh, fixed. And the reason for that is uh, uh, if we look at what's happening inside of the gap and uh, the horizontal axis is the frequency and then the, uh, the, the direction uh, perpendicular to the uh, screen is the uh, uh, along the gap. And uh, on the left hand side, that is the structure, uh, surface structure uh, inside of the gap. And, uh, you know, for the first mode, and then we've got uh, M equals three mode, and then five mode and seven mode. That is for the fixed one. And uh, for the like uh, uh, floating one, it, which is shown on the right hand side, they all plotted using the same scale. Now you can see on the right hand side, it's much bigger. And also what you gonna see is the, the M equal one mode disappeared, totally disappeared. And uh, what we have is we got like a camel back mode shape which is dominating. And then the largest response is not in the middle. It's in one quarter and the three quarters of, of the gap. <coughs> and uh, the, the reason for this phenomenon is because of the, uh, the body motion for sure. And uh, we invest which motion mode uh, introduced this phenomenon. And it was uh, turned out to be the sway motion. And uh, this is uh, what the sway motion look like. And uh, so on the top uh, left corner, that is the, uh, the, you know, what's happening if we send a wave group pass through the uh, two boxes with one is floating. And uh, the top left corner is the time, you know, the sway motion signals. And, and then we break down the, um, uh, signal components into the different uh, harmonics, which is shown on the bottom uh, left corner. And the, the blue one is a linear component. And the sorry, black one is the uh, linear component. And then the red one and the, the blue one is the second harmonic. The red one is the, uh, uh, and, and then we plot them, uh, we, plot the uh, spectrum of these components on the right-hand side. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, the color is uh, obvious. The middle one is the black color, which is, uh, uh, you know, the uh, sway motion uh, as the frequency of the instant wave. And then the uh, very spiky blue curve, uh, which is the uh, second order difference term. And that's, that's because of the uh, uh, you know, the second order components lined up with the uh, uh, mooring line natural frequency and then got the strong resonance motions. And on the right hand side, the, uh, the red curves, and um, that is the second harmonics of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the waves uh, interacting with the uh, uh, gap resonance mode and give us strong resonance motions and uh, pushing the uh, the vessel um, backwards, yeah, forward and backward. And that is, uh, yeah, from this kind of uh, uh, plus, we cover the uh, the linear response and the second order difference term and also the uh, second order sum term. And uh, that may explain, you know, the, the various uh, nonlinearities. And, uh, the final slides I'm gonna show is the uh, uh, the scaling um, uh, of the uh, uh, the responses, and uh, on the left hand side that is the uh, uh, signal measured or the response uh, of the the vessel 
uh, so the uh, that's the response of the gap and uh, driven by different uh, incident with amplitude so the uh, black one is driven by a larger incident wave and the red one is driven by a smaller incident wave and uh, um, what we're going to do is we break down the components and uh, then we can uh, uh, compare the, the, two, the, the components between the two responses. On the right hand side, that is the breakdown of the components. And uh, the blue one is the linear components of the response, and the red one is the uh, second harmonic, and uh, the green one is the third harmonic. And uh, then the uh, um, pink one is the uh, uh, fourth harmonic. So we now we you know there are two curves on each subplot the solid curve or the colored curve are the results from the large uh, amplitude and uh, then we scale the smaller amplitude case up to the bigger one and for the linear part we use the uh, coefficient because the, there is a ratio between the smaller one and the large one the linear coefficient uh, is enough for us to reproduce the large one from the small one to uh, match the large one. And for the second harmonic, we need uh, times the coefficient squared. Is that if we still use the linear component, it won't match. And then for the third harmonic, we need uh, to use the uh, coefficient cube. And then for the fourth one, we need the uh, coefficient uh, hard word, the quadruple, quad, uh, quad, quad yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know that word, and uh, uh, yeah, so th this is to show uh, a, a nice scaling, you know, or demonstrating the of the different harmonics uh, in one experiment, and. Uh, yeah, to sum up, and uh, uh, yeah, I have been using the uh, uh, slide to cover the uh, potential flow calculation, CFD modeling, and uh, uh, wheel base and testing. And uh, from this, we use the wheel group technology to unlock some new physics and uh, also improved the prediction model. And uh, through this, we also collaborate the uh, uh, collaborating with the industry partners. And uh, from uh, the the impact of this study, uh, produced the uh, you know, contributing to design guidelines and uh, grants, and also uh, publications to the uh, academic um, uh, to the academia. And also, this we see the uh, the potential of the uh, uh, the knowledge. Uh, the techniques to transform to uh, like uh, other uh, offshore system like uh, floating wind turbines. And uh, yeah, that, that is the last slide. And uh, if you got any questions, uh, happy to take any question. Yeah. So question for the room as much as uh, yourself, Wenwa. Um, do we see any evidence of uh, gap resonance in uh, floating facilities with side-by-side -side uploading? I can think of one. Uh, uh, yes. Um, so there is a large uh, floating facility um, northwest of Australia that does do side-by-side -side offloading. So yeah, we we had some, um, that video you showed, um, I've got one like that actually for, uh, for, for that particular facility. But um, interestingly enough, what, what we've found is, is gap resonance happens not with beam on seas as much, but more so head, head seas. So that's something I found interesting that uh, the occurrence has been more uh, head, head seas than, than beam on. I Uh, 
next question. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. We, we also looked at the head seal and the other um, uh, conditions as well. And because uh, here, you know, the BMC uh, is for the soil condition and also easy to address the problem. But for head seal, we do have the, uh, yeah, actually for head seal, we're gonna excite the various uh, different gap mode, not the, only the symmetric mode, but also the asymmetric one, which is, uh, uh, you, you know, you got a sine wave, which is uh, like a zero at the two end and in the middle, but it got the peaks at one quarter and the three quarters, and which is the MA call two mode, which is the asymmetric one. And, uh, you know, because of that, the uh, largest uh, gap resonance response is not in the middle. It's kind of uh, uh, around one quarter uh, uh, in, along the gap. And uh, yeah, we, we do have that sort of uh, uh, numerical simulation and also the experimental data. Yeah. yeah, I can certainly vouch for the um, doubling of the, the wave height and the gap. It's uh, yeah, you know, having sort of what what is relatively flat flat seas and that um, you know, significant location is good. Is good. Thanks. Um, I wondered about the resonance of the gap. So I assume this is probably linked to industry in this case and maybe is what defines the gap. But yeah, I was, I was just interested by the fact that you had seven portions, all of which are pretty common like periods. If you designed a different structure, would you need that gap resonance? Yeah, if we have different stru structures, uh, or if you change the size of the vessel, the uh, the natural frequency of the gap modes will be changed slightly. And uh, yeah, maybe six seconds, or oh, depends on the, the size of the vessel. If you got a larger vessel, then it may go up to uh, like eight seconds. Yeah, it's gonna be uh, very depends on the, uh, uh, dimension of this structure. Yeah. So I guess the con for context for anyone in this room who didn't understand why I was asking that, is obviously six to eight seconds is primarily your wind driven C waves. Yes, yeah. Swell is really common in offshore WA between about 12 and well, 17 or 18 seconds, and then your super long periods start. Yeah. Anywhere between 17 and 23, 23 is pretty long, but yeah. you kind of the, the natural waves that you get here are exciting all of the yeah. modes that you don't Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, for, for the Wednesday, you know, definitely that's going to be linear excitation, which might, will be much stronger. The, you know, for, and uh, because that's the resonance system. And, uh, yeah, so that way it's the uh, kind of, easy to predict or it's more like well understood for, for the linear excitation. And you could conceivably have three different wave chains all running, exciting all three of those uh, uh, interacting. Yeah, that, that, that is actually possible because uh, if you got Wednesday from the head head on uh, mm -hmm. the, the head uh, the, the heading C and then swells come from the beam C so essentially, you, you can get that sort of waves excite the gap modes in one go. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But keep in mind the amplitude scaling, right? So the linear scales linearly, but if, if you decrease the size of the of that third order one by half, then you're going to go down by a factor of eight. So yeah, it, it would be special conditions to have that happening. Sure. Yeah. That's what all this group stuff is about, sort of amplitude and phase. So the amplitudes are significantly different. But 
other questions? All right. Yep. I'm just going to show this. What I failed to play before. So we're talking about directionally focused groups. So this is one in a round tank. Um, so that bit's not necessarily potential flow, but anyway, I think that's the best example um, of a of a circularly focused wave, and then they can do uh, other creative stuff. I'm not actually sure what you call that one. Um, that was just an aside to, to complete some unfinished business from the last session. If I can get the mouse back. Um, we're going to go on to another application, which is um, green water and nonlinear diffraction around FPSOs. This is more work conducted in the hub, um, mainly by Lee Fen Chen, who's online. Um, and I hope we'll be back here soon to do some more work on, on this sort of stuff. Um, so green water is also a problem um, in, in the facilities around here. Um, so green water is where water comes up above the deck level of a vessel, flows onto the deck and causes damage to structures on deck. Um, one of those images is from the field and then there are some images from CFD. So that CFD simulation we compared to some experiments by someone else. Leafin ran CFD, it was again a focused wave group, a fixed vessel. The water ran up, ran across the deck. So you can see the first stage is the water runs above the freeboard, then it runs across the deck, hits this vertical wall, which is supposed to mimic some topside facilities, and then it um, impacts the wall. Um, and it's not shown here, but the comparisons of the force um, computed by CFD compared very well with what was measured in the experiments there. So similar to the to the wave in deck um, uh, from before, um, but obviously the question is which which wave do you run to do this? So we've been in the green water space, I guess, looking at how we can do the sort of calculation of the impacts. Um, if you want to know more about that, also Min over there has been doing some work on that. But then also about screening, so which wave will actually cause that green water event? And I guess this work has been more about understanding nonlinear scattering for this first stage of, of, of which wave is driving elevation above the deck level to then run across and cause impacts. And so we've looked at diffraction um, modeling, um, model testing and CFD simulations and tried again to decompose um, those harmonic components of, of, the, of the wave field. So the the thing here is, I guess, is that in the, in the previous talk when I was looking at the body motions and at um, uh, the gap resonance, and the gap resonance is almost like another body because it only it only oscillates in its resonant mode. So if you know what it's doing at one position, you know what it's doing everywhere. Whereas for green water, we don't quite have the same thing going on. So we we're looking around the outside of the vessel, and actually we're obviously concerned if water comes up above the deck level at any point on the vessel. So we'd actually like to do these sort of decompositions um, around in, in space around the vessel. So any point could be of interest and we, and we sort of want to screen for any of them. I mean, we sort of have some ideas, obviously, that um, the green water is more likely at some positions than others. So uh, the first step was to just do a simple linear analysis and then look at design waves. So this is a, a generic FPSO. Um, these are run up calculations um, around those points around the around the side of the vessel and the normalized run up um, relative motion is highest at the bow but for each of those points you can do a, a design wave calculation to say which wave group is most likely to give um, significant run up above the freeboard here um, and then you can also run that through um, uh, an analysis to look at the effect of, of, of real storms passing through and, and real, different relative headings um, to the environment and different wave spreadings and so on. Um, so, and, and look at different um, response levels. So here's a sort of 100 year return period cases. 
um, on an HSTP um, scatterplot. Oops, wrong button. Um, and so there are a series of, of, of large responses like we've been talking about today. Uh, so the response, so run up at one of the points, um, are all collected there, and the design waves look something like this. Um, so they don't actually, um, they're not, not nearly as large, but what they're just, that's a wave that's designed to come in and, and maximise both the vessel motion and the free surface elevation. So the relative motion between those is, is the, the biggest possible to drive free surface um, above the deck level. And so having determined those design waves, we can then try and run those design waves in a, in a wave flume on a slightly simplified version um, of that FPSO. So this one is, is basically um, prismatic when viewed from above. So it has rounded ends and wave gauges, but this is in a, a narrow flume and, and waves would send some of these design waves in on this vessel and, and measure um, surface elevations around it and, in, and on the deck as well. So this is what it what it looked like in the in the tank. Um, so the the big picture is the the global motion and the inset. I just play that again because um, it's pretty fast. The inset is is the bow, so you can see there's a bit of run up and then you get this big overtopping. So the design wave is doing its job of of in this short compact group. Um, we get this large response, so a lot of water is overtopping um, onto the deck of the vessel. Um, and indeed, we so I said before, this sometimes is a little bit um, tricky to reproduce um, the design wave in the experiment because the, the shape of the group changes. You go down, but here it's done pretty well, so that the black is the experiment and um, the red, sorry, the red is the experiment and the black is the target. So we, we match what we wanted and then got, um, did phase combinations on that, which is shown in the right panel. So these 90 degree phase shifts to try and extract harmonics. Um, and then uh, with those phase combinations, you can extract harmonics. Is that off? No, it's still on. Um, the, like what Wenhua was showing for the gap, I and mean, we'll come back to that um, in a bit more detail. Um, so, and then associated with those design waves, um, so we're trying to maximize this one. So we're trying to, the design wave is designed to maximize relative motion between the free surface and the vessel at the bow so that the water goes onto the vessel. But then associated with that is a certain heave motion and pitch motion because basically what the design wave is trying to do is drive the bow down and heave and pitch and then drive water up. Um, it's doing a pretty good job um, for these. So these are just the linear components of, of the motions and the relative, relative motions, but the vessel motions are pretty much linear anyway. So it's, it's pretty good. Um, and then try to do the same thing in CFD um, because we've seen in CFD that we could, for example, um, run this design wave to get water on the deck and we could put different structures on the deck on the same design wave, so with different structures on the deck or different heights, for example. Um, so this is using open foam again and, and with the support of Pawsey. And so this is what it looks like if we run this design wave in, in CFD. So there's a little bit there, but this is the main overtopping event now. The water flows across the deck and, and would impact the structure if there was a structure in this simulation. But um, the design waves um, doing a good job. But that's just that so far we've just really it's a linear design wave and we've just um, sent linear components match what we expected. Um, but there's a lot more going on in this CFD simulation that we'd like to, to draw out. Uh, and which we, which we can do using the design ways and phase combinations. Um, so this is the comparison between the CFD and the experiment. Um, rather than the, previously we were showing the linear comparisons of the experiment. So these are um, on the top, the total 
relative motion and the bottom the linearized so you can see uh, the linear is slightly smaller than the than the total so that the high harmonics have been emitted in the linear signal and and the motions compare um, uh, very well as well and so we've got relative motion at midships on the left and and vessel motion on the right so we get good comparison but what we're interested in doing as i said is, is breaking down this harmonic structure because we want to understand how to screen for which event is the worst and we need to understand how things scale so things that scale quadratically with wave amplitude as we obviously increase in severity they're going to increasingly dominate the run-up compared to those that just scale linearly. Um, so again, using the four phase um, decomposition to break down the, the harmonics here shown up to the fifth harmonic. So this is a, a fixed FPSO. Um, and this is the, the total field. So the, the waves interacting with the with the fixed FPSO and, and the the um the time series over here are what's happening at the bow so there's a, a different low frequency this is the linear signal there's a second harmonic third harmonic and, and fourth harmonic so higher and higher frequency wiggles getting smaller but then scaling up faster and faster with the wave amplitude and it's interesting to see that the um the difference frequency run up at the bow so this this low frequency lump is actually about 20% of the total runner. So if you just considered linear and neglected that, you'd be missing, missing that. And actually the third order, um, maybe about 5%, 5% of the linear anyway. Um, so so those, those would traditionally probably be neglected in this sort of run up analysis, but they're actually quite significant. And so here, I said we look interested spatially. So here we're doing something a bit different to what was done before, but it's using the CFD, you have information on the full field. And so we can isolate these different harmonic components for the whole field. So the, the left plot there is just linear interaction. So that you could get from um, a linear calculation. But if you if you note here, this this is this lump of of low frequency runoff, which is extremely localized at the bow. That's one of these nonlinear interactions, uh, which potentially could be calculated in, in potential flow theory. Um, but that's that 20% lump. So, so locally, at the point where the waves encounter the bow, there's this, this localized run up, um, which is effectively lifting the whole um, sea surface up, up locally at a, a slow time scale compared to the waves. And this, and then here are the, the higher harmonics, the faster faster wiggles so the individual from from left to right second third and fourth harmonics split up um, and you can see this as it appears to be sort of nothing coming in and then waves kind of come out of the ship um, which is a bit unusual but that's because uh, there's, there's a wave structure interaction going on here where the, the incident second harmonic is quite small but the interaction of the waves with the ship generates additional second harmonic run-up terms and so ultimately, if you're screening where around the ship, you're going to have worse run up and green water on deck. Ideally, you would take account of all of these, or maybe you could neglect the fourth harmonic. Um, but ideally, you take account of all of these and then bring them into your screening to say which, which point on the vessel are we going to get worse green water, which type of wave. And, and you could then tweak your design wave to try to maximize not just the linear run up, but the linear run up plus the second order plus the, the low frequency run up plus the however high you want to go, but tweak your design wave to give you that run up. Question to you on, on all these analysis, the, the vessel gets slightly orientated to the wave direction. Is that, yep. is that done deliberately to maximize or you couldn't you It's done to deliberately to give a more interesting video. I mean, we also did the head on case, um, but it's not, it's, you know, I mean, I guess green water in this part of the world means cyclones essentially so it's not unusual to have a misalignment between at least some of the wave field and um, the vessel actually quite likely um, so I think it's it's pretty realistic but but yeah I mean you, we, we did head on as well just there are already a lot of um, a lot of information here 
Uh, and this, this that's for a fixed vessel. So now we start to add in um, moving vessel, and and the plots so the plots on the right are for um, uh, the point on the bow that's indicated with the red dot. So the, the wave group's gone past, and again we can extract um, the components of run up, um, which look um, much like they did before, but they they will actually be be slightly altered. I mean it's traditionally the case that we see that the, the vessel motions themselves don't have much higher harmonic content, but the vessel motions will influence the nature of the of the nonlinear scattering. So I think you can see that actually this in the difference frequency plot here, the hump of water at the front uh, is a little bit smaller than it was previously, but it's still there, it still localizes um, and will have an impact on the on the runner. And just again for, for moving vessels. Well, anyway, the the same same thing going on. Um, high harmonic scattering around the moving vessel, and ultimately we'd like to maximize. Um, we'd like to screen by by identifying design modes that sort of can maximize all of this run up to get the total maximum total run up around the vessel. Uh, so here's some comparisons of of experiments and, and CFD simulations um, for some of these run up components, um, which is important, I guess, to check that. I mean, some of these run up components are quite small, and we need to check that what we're doing is sensible. But the agreement. Um, in general uh, is extremely good. Um, so the CFD is in red and, and the experiments in gray. So the match is pretty good. It's not it's not always um, perfect, but it's 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 pretty good. And that's partly because we, we're using these clean experiments by using wave groups, both in the experiment and in the CFD. Um, and this is just breaking it down, um, breaking down the run up contributions um, at the bow. So just to, to choose this oblique attack case. Um, so there's the total run up is partly due to the black wave is, is the wave going up and the, the blue curve is the vessel going down due to pitch and the red curve is the vessel going down due to heave. So at the time of the maximum event, it's pitched down, it's heaved down and the wave is up. So that they're not all perfectly aligned because um, that's that's not how the the relative phasing works. But that's that's how you get the maximum maximum run up. Um, but again, ideally, that would be done to maximise all the nonlinear components above to also have peaks in the wave elevation at that time. Um, so here we've got um, an indication of what the the freeboard level is. So this is just showing what, what overtopping would look like. Um, this is relative motion actually. So we did experiments with and without overtopping. So we had a vessel which had sort of very, very tall walls and then one where it just had the normal deck. Um, and the run up is essentially unaltered by the fact that a small amount of it, I mean, relatively small, at full scale it might be, I don't know, I can't remember what it was, three meters or four meters or something. But in the lab, it's quite small, goes under the deck. Um, so that's good because obviously in our screening, we'd like to, in our screening for which events cause green water, we'd like to ignore the fact that some water goes on the deck. Um, and this is just showing the effect of, of green water on the vessel motion. So again, it, it's essentially negligible. A little bit of water goes on the deck, but it doesn't massively change the, the mass properties. Um, so we've looked at wave structure interactions sort of in space for four phase decomposition using ooh, using wave groups. Um, it works well with and without green water. The body motions are mostly linear, but the wave scattering, there's quite a lot of nonlinear um, physics going on. And ideally we'd, we'd sort of screen by taking account of as much of that as, as we need to. Definitely this difference term, 20% um, um, would be important to, to keep. Um, yeah, and so so we're thinking about how we can screen with, with taking account of, of high harmonic components. 
um, this slide keeps progressing by itself. So I guess that's the <laughs> that's the end of that. Um, it's about about time anyway. I mean, any questions on that? Or there's one more example to go before we move into the future work. Bill, Mike, can you just comment on? Um, you mentioned cyclonic conditions and FPSO. So you've been talking about trade seas and and waves coming in a different direction. So how will that? Your all your analysis is for a single, this say for a single long-crested wave, waves. Single long-crested waves. Um, but how? Um, so you can't do experiments in a flume, but apart from that, um, it's sort of you can follow the same methodology. So you can you can create the waves in CFD. Um, you can do experiments. Of different yes, yeah, so you can do. You could do a linear analysis, produce a design wave, produce a directionally focused group. Um, I guess for a structure that's as long as this, maybe you'd want to think about um, potentially whether you focused it at the front of the vessel or at midship. I don't know whether that would make a difference for the typical wavelengths, but essentially the same methodology could work. It's just that um, for this case, we know that some of these nonlinear effects can be included relatively straightforwardly from that double sum, essentially for wave structure interaction. If you do it directionally, then it's a it's four sums, quadruple sum, and the, the matrices get a bit out of hand. Um, but yeah, in, in theory, it can be, can be done. Is this one? Yes, on. Uh, just maybe uh, more like not a question, maybe a comment or additional information, because I think uh, uh, UAE together with some other participants of type like Woodside, I believe Shell, Bureau Veritas, ABS, and maybe somebody else as well. We are part of Greenwater GIP, which is running already for how long? Maybe three years, or two years. <laughs> so, and obviously, uh, UAE providing valuable research uh, results for this uh, GIP. But really, just maybe my comment is maybe sort of from practical perspective, this 20% what was described here, this nonlinearity is probably quite important, definitely. But in reality, probably if we had really 20% accuracy in green water prediction, I think I would be very happy. It's not happening yet. Uh, so really, uh, even considering even uncertainty of mid-ocean conditions, like 20% is probably nothing in this uh, very complicated problem. I think the, the biggest problem we are working with is green water GIP currently is to, I think you mentioned this, to identify this governing events or effectively indicator of the highest green water load. Uh, when I joined this GIP about three years ago, uh, I think again, I with GIP promise we will find something much better than just relative weight valuation, effectively, maybe exceedance of freeboard. And unfortunately, after three years, we couldn't find anything better. So effectively, this uh, relative valuation uh, remains the only sort of uh, indicator of uh, maximum green water load. It's not necessarily even height, it's actually a load which acts on the structure. So, and really currently the main challenge is really to identify these events which create this highest green water load. And currently I think uh, we are trying to identify maybe 10 or so maybe events which may create this highest green water load. So effectively, I think maybe we're missing something in physics because really we're very good in sometimes making numbers. We have big computers, CFD and so on, but just maybe to understand physics of this event. Somebody said even during last uh, GIP meeting at night a week ago that maybe there could be different types of green water events. It could be more like dam break or some other events, maybe more like a plunging wave and so on. So just maybe I think maybe we haven't yet reached understanding of this event in full. And maybe for future generations, it could be many PhDs and research in this area. Yeah, thanks. That's a fair comment. Yeah, there's there's a lot more to the problem. Um, not all of which sort of fits into the scope of the talk, but there is more that we've done. I mean, we also looked at we did we have looked at the different types of overtopping. We have looked at um, different indicators for what gives a big load. And one of the things we looked at was whether the relative duration of the overtopping, so the the time. That the freeboard is above the deck relative to this time scale of a dam to run out, a dam break. Um, 
And that seemed to work just about as well as relative wave elevation from the little bit of data that I looked at for, for random waves. Um, but it's very, um, it's a very tricky problem. I mean, so if the duration was important, for example, this long lived hump of water at the bow might be quite important because the duration of that um, is quite long. And so it will effectively lengthen the time at which any given short wave will be above the freeboard. Um, yeah, it's just very tricky because, you know, you do a, if you do a long run in green water, you, you, you get several impacts, um, not many, and, and then try and establish what was causing those. So, yeah, I mean, we'll probably discuss again, but uh, green water is, is a really tricky problem because it, it involves, um, I guess, a design wave. For, you have to get the water up there and then propagate across the deck and then have impacts and there's a lot, a lot in it. Things. Can you hear me? Yeah, a yeah. couple of things stood out for me. So the angle of attack of the hull to the uh, oncoming waves, and, and you mentioned that it was more for um, looks on the on the on the screen rather than a reflection of reality. But having said that, I'm I'm not sure whether Dimitri will agree with this or not. But having stood on the deck of a number of FDSOs. Um, it's become quite apparent to me that when they are freely weather vaning, they do adopt a 15, 20, sometimes 30 degree angle of attack to the oncoming sea or sea state as well. Why, I'm not sure, but I think she, the length of the vessel is just trying to find a sweet spot between wave crests or a number of wave crests. Um, so she adjusts herself to, to, uh, to achieve that. The other thing is FPSO conversions, the ships have a forecastle. And so you've got greater freeboard at the bow than you do say midships or aft. And so I think folk, there are two parts to this. If you're creating a, a large wave event at the bow in your simulation, that's great for um, exciting the heave pitch motion. Um, but the greatest green water impact will actually happen somewhere after the forecastle where your deck is actually lower to your mean sea level. So um, yeah, th that were just things that popped into my mind as, as you presented that. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a really interesting comment on the, what you see in the field that, it, it, I mean, calculations indicate to us it's possible to get, you know, these oblique angles. It's nice to have that confirmed. Um, and I mean, that's, I guess, why we were doing this spatial decompositions, right? So if, if we weren't just looking at a point showing time series, when we did show time series at the bow, but actually we could have extracted that information for any point and we could do actually could focus the group at a different point on the vessel. I mean, it might not make that much that much difference. I mean, the, the wavelengths are fairly long compared to the vessel, but um, yeah, it's something we're aware of and trying by looking at the spatial field rather than just a point to keep that in mind. Yep, thanks. All right, um, I'll flick over to the last example. Presentation. So this is um, yeah, newer stuff on on. So we're going to have a bit on fixed offshore wind turbines and a bit on floaters, um, which I'll run through quickly so that we have time to wrap up and get out of here on time. So this is actually a project again, not part of the hub. Well, neither of these are part of the hub, but to flesh out this idea of using focus wave groups um, for different applications. So this is work that Paul's involved in. Um, primarily in, in the UK, um, well, called the, the Sea Swallows Project. Um, but do a good job of um, coming up with the acronyms. <laughs> um, so the idea is to, to come up with um, forces on a column, so that the monopile supporting a, 
a fixed offshore wind turbine. Uh, and and we're, so we've sort of, we've, I guess we've done diffraction now and we're sort of back into a different part of Wen Hua's um, loading regime space where we're now, I guess, basically looking at um, inertia type loads. So as we've um, discussed, I guess, repeatedly, if we have a, a Stokes type decomposition, then it would be great to be able to break the force down into first harmonic, second harmonic, third, fourth, um, fifth and so on harmonics with um, some sort of general um, coefficients for phase and amplitude that we could apply to an incident wave signal and, and extract a force time series. Um, and there's a, a force time series shown here, which, which is um, broken down in, in this way. Um, yeah, you don't really see a difference frequency term like we saw we saw previously. Um, and so what, what this project in the UK is trying to do is to um, produce this library of, of coefficients. Um, so amplitude and phase coefficients for each um, for each harmonic as a function of, of non-dimensional cylinder radius, water depth and wave steepness. Um, and if those coefficients can be obtained, then this is essentially a recipe for all sort of non-slam type wave loads on, on monopiles um, using sort of a focused wave group approach and, and Stokes harmonics so that the coefficients could be obtained by using experiments or simulations. Um, sort of as you've seen throughout the, the talk, I mean, it's possible now to get pretty good agreement between them, but it's always worth checking. Um, so here's a, a four phase decomposition run um, from, from wave groups. So, and the, the extracted harmonics are shown here in the time domain and in the frequency domain um, with the different colors. So blue is linear and, and so on and so on. Um, that's been presented. The decomposition method is common to some of the other applications. Um, and there are some, I mean, it generally works extremely well. Um, there are just some, uh, some funny things going on for some reason at, at, at third order. Um, I said previously that for waves, there's something special about third order that um, nonlinear dispersion comes in. I mean, the, for the wave structure interaction, there's also the possibility of, uh, well, there are various local local things in the flow which can happen, um, which means I guess the agreement for the third harmonic is, is less good. But in general, um, using this approach, the simple approach of, of having a, a library of coefficients to go from the linear force to all those harmonics and build up a nonlinear force profile uh, works very well. And their roadmap um, for the project uh, is to use these simulations and, and experiments to extract the coefficients, um, designing the experiments with Bayesian inference. Um, the, and, and then using, using that again for, for um, data, data analysis. Um, then the force coefficients can be applied um, to breaking to non-breaking waves, um, and, and so there's some account taken of uncertainty there, I guess, in, in what's been done to to produce these coefficients. Um, and then the last point is is breaking waves, which is uh, sort of a whole different loading regime. So if you get a very steep crest that actually slams onto the cylinder then this smooth Stokes type harmonic loading um, will no longer hold. Um, and, and some additional terms need to be need to be um, used. So there will be experiments in various places, um, both sort of inline and spread waves like we've talked about throughout um, potential flow and CFD simulations to produce a library of coefficients. Um, looking for design waves and also considering the structural dynamics. Uh, so that's a very brief tour through um, a, an approach that will hopefully produce 
a recipe for designing offshore wind monopiles um, very uh, simply, but also high reliability. Um, but the other side of floating wind is is is, is floaters, um, and this again is is from a, a European project, a float step project. Um, this is work done by Jan Orsagova, who's part of our group. Uh, so for this this floater um, is a Tetris bar floater. People may have seen it. Um, maybe requires a bit more explanation as it's less standard than a monopile. So it's it's a, a floater. Stability comes from this keel, which is suspended below the floater by um, a network of sort of taut keel lines. Um, there's, there's a turbine floating on top placed centrally. So the whole thing is um, a triangle if, if viewed from above. Uh, the floater is, the idea of the floater is it's made of slender elements, so similar elements to those you might use for a monopile. Um, we looked at mostly at pitch responses because they tend to be most critical for aerodynamics um, or the turbine. Uh, there was some wave only tests done and we looked at different sea states from operational to extreme. And again, phase combination runs were done for wave groups and for irregular waves, but only for one amplitude, which was unfortunate. Um, so the time series of the pitch response is shown in the black curve here, and we used um, simple frequency filtering to filter out the, this blue curve is, is the response of the wave frequencies, uh, and that's, that's non-resonant, so essentially there's actually not much response at those frequencies. But the, the natural frequency in pitch is um, a very long period, and so even though there's no wave energy or not much, no linear wave energy at that, those frequencies, um, something is exciting the pitch motion. And be, using this phase combination approach, we split the, the even harmonic terms in the red from the um, odd harmonic terms in the blue. And so the, yeah, the, the blue and the red here plus the blue here make, make the black here. So it's the total response. Um, so the, the even harmonic low frequency response we understand, that's that difference frequency term. That's the same thing that was driving that mound of water on the front of the FPSO. So that long, slow buildup. So that would, that long, slow um, sort of type processes here at second order would drive a long, slow pitch of the turbine. So that's fine. We think we understand that. But the, uh, the, the odd harmonic, um, we don't understand. Um, people, I mean, don't typically do phase separation type experiments. Uh, so probably don't typically notice this, but we had no idea what, what was going on. Um, so there were two ideas. Uh, idea one is it's actually third order difference frequency potential flow. Um, so essentially, if you expand a, a linear wave, say a, a cos omega t to uh, cubed, you actually get, um, so the sum frequency is at, is at three omega, but there's also a response at just omega. That, that's for, a, for just a regular wave. Um, but if we generalize that, um, it actually spreads out over quite a, a wide frequency range. And so that's what, what's shown here. This dark black line is the incident linear range. The purple line is the sum frequency, so even harmonic sum frequency. The red line is the even harmonic difference frequency, which is one I said we understand, we think we do. Um, and this dark blue line is the third harmonic difference frequency. Um, the scaling here is, is, is not right. It's just showing where the energy would be um, for this incident spectrum. So that's one option. And, and although this is um, low frequency, if it's this option, the amplitude scaling is, is A cubed. So if you increase the amplitude, it would, it would increase a lot. The other option is it's Morrison drag. Um, and if we expand Morrison drag again, we, we get um, sort of high, we get a third harmonic term and a, a linear term, and that's shown here in, for a broadband excitation is this light blue term. So you can actually get excitation from these two processes in the same frequency range. The difference is they have different amplitude scaling. 
and maybe they behave differently. So we, we tried to look at um, the responses to um, the sort of the top plots here can be considered, I guess, as um, like a new wave in, in, in the thing that drives here the difference frequency, um, even response, and then what would drive third order response and what would drive Morrison response. Um, and both of these seem to give an equally large, almost identical response. Um, so that didn't tell us actually which process was 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 happening. So we tried to look at go back and look at amplitude scaling. And to be brief, um, the the plots at the bottom here for the Morrison plots uh, quite close to a, a one one line. Meaning, if we assume that it's quadratic scaling, we get good results. If we assume that it's cubic scaling, we get not so good results. They're not linear. They're they're lying on a um, a different power line, um, and this is what it looks like for the one that we think we understand. So it's on it's on the line. So this was hinting to us that um, it's it's Morrison drag that's so low. For, Morrison drag terms give some excitation at the natural frequency, which gives some contribution to the pitch motion. So it's probably quadratic scaling instead of cubic scaling, which is good news as far as what happens in a storm. Um, and you might say, who cares? Because if you just assumed it was all low frequency, it was, it was just all the red stuff and you didn't bother doing phase separation, it would have scaled quadratically anyway. Um, but when you try to do your design, your models would be completely wrong because you'd be trying to sort of, you, you, your potential flow models would only give you half of the response you were getting. If you're thinking, what's going on? Um, I see that everything's in this low frequency difference range. So basically applying phase separation here enabled us to see a new forcing mechanism that hadn't previously been observed for floating wind. So this, the fact that the structure is made up of these slender elements, I guess means that basically Morrison drag type loading um, gives us excitation at very low frequencies. And that's the end of, of the brief tour through a couple of floating wind examples. Um, does anyone have questions on those? I don't know if that was too fast or... And we're uh, hoping to do a lot, a lot more um, stuff in this space because um, there's some, some very interesting new physics there. Ed? Yep. Can, can you get a microphone? This, this one? Yeah, so is, is, the, is the GP in that using the first few terms there from the, the Stokes, you know, you got F1 plus F2 and F1 plus F2 plus dot, dot, dot. And there's also a GP in there giving uncertainty bounds. Can you expand on that at all? Uh, I can't expand on that one. Okay. Well, but Paul might be able to. Okay. Um, I can well, I can try a little bit, although I'm not an expert on any of this, this uh, statistical stuff. The sort of pink shaded stuff is just confidence intervals estimated by bootstrapping the data sets to give us some level of confidence as to, to uh, the effect of sample variability. The, the solid lines are the fits and the uh, analysis to produce the coefficients has been done in two forms. One as a best fit to the data which would actually be a line that's a bit lower than the pink, the purple line. And the second one is a, is a fit where we try and minimize the loads while maximizing the chance of, of not being, of being unconservative in terms of prediction. Um, the, the details of the GP method, I refer you to the uh, research assistant in Oxford. Done. Thanks, Paul. I 
said right at the start that pitch was the relevant motion from a turbine's perspective, and I, I didn't know quite what you meant by that. In, in what context is pitch? Um, from, like, is it? Do you mean from fatigue, from power? For yeah, so, so obviously aerodynamically it is. Um, so you, I mean, you get um, change in the relative velocity from surge as well, but the surge frequency is much lower, so the, the change in velocity is much lower. But also I think for the um, the bearings that allow the, t the nacelle to weather vane, uh, to point into the wind, that don't like large inclinations. Um, is my understanding, and so I mean, for for on um, fixed turbines, um, they have quite tight limits to I think protect the, that rotating mechanism. But I mean, here we totally way exceed what the limits would be for a for a fixed turbine. So I, th I think um, that, that that's the re the reason, uh, as I understand it. Well, I, th I think there are a couple couple issues because probably I mean this sea state that was run um, to produce these results was was run without wind because it's such a large sea state that probably everything would be shut down. Um, uh, so it's, it's sort of a, a storm case. So it's likely that um, in that case it would be a waves alone case. So the question is if, if there are waves alone. Why would you not want pitch? And I think the reason is to protect the mechanical components in the turbine. If if, if the turbine's also operating, then you have all these aerodynamic issues as well, right? So and then yeah, you have you know large motions um, of the turbine in and out of the, the flow, um, you know, which which may or may not be aligned with the wind direction, I suppose. Um, yeah, so different challenges there. But but then. So, so these tests, there, though there was no, you know, relative, no aerodynamic damping because the, the turbine wasn't on, and, and no um, low frequency motion driven by the aerodynamics, which obviously there should be. Um, but I mean, that that's just <laughs> too complicated to have it all. So we try and simplify it down. Just look at the waves at the moment. Yeah. The gyroscopic effect of the turbine is resisting the pitching motion and therefore the bearing you talked about is where the, the bearing sees probably its highest load is um, the, the hydrodynamics is trying to pitch it but the gyroscope is preventing it from pitching and the bearing is optimal. Yeah, I mean, it's when when they're when they're it's all operating. I mean, it's this incredibly interesting problem because also, I mean, the, the behavior of the controller on the turbine is is critical. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we didn't go into all of those issues. <laughs> we uh, we consulted our partners in the project and, and said which you know which motion is most critical and, and sort of said. Probably, probably pitch. Look at that first. But um, there's a lot more to do in floating wind. Yeah, interesting area. Um, we've got a quick set of um, future work wrap up slides. Which um, Paul, would you like to to talk to? Yep, I'm happy to do that. We're, we're trying to uh, finish by eight o'clock, but. We may have handed you an impossible task. I've only, got, I've only got a few slides. I'll go through them quickly. OK, so um, thank you to the previous speakers, my colleagues. Um, 
you've seen a lot of decomposition of responses or waves and responses into harmonic components and the use of wave groups to do that. Um, from my point of view, I think it reveals the important physics in a way that's otherwise inaccessible. It helps in building predictive models. Well, first of all, in understanding that physics and then attempting to build predictive models for it. And the methodology of wave groups and uh, four phase decomposition can be applied physically and also to CFD and it's helpful for both. Next slide, please. Um, first application area um, for some of this work. Well, a, a first application would be lightweight jackets for fixed offshore wind. There's a lot of developments. I mean, almost all the developments so far of offshore wind turbines have been on fixed structures, both monopiles and in deeper water where the winds tend to be a bit better. Um, lightweight jackets, three leg lightweight jackets. And we now have a methodology to do wind, wave and current loading on these simultaneously. And they're rather dynamically sensitive structures because they're fairly lightweight. But in my view, we can now do a complete collapse analysis, accounting for the changes of fluid loading as the structure starts to move. And with a structural analysis code from offshore engineering, um, USFOS, we can couple that into open foam to do full dynamic simulations of collapse which has not been done before. So I think that would be very interesting and worthwhile. For waves, um, you've already seen the drought in the wave. Uh, we can't make it in a, in a unidirectional sea or a slightly spread sea. We can make it in a crossing sea, but we could probably also make it in a hurricane sea state where both you have directional spreading of each frequency component, but the wave, uh, the mean wave direction of each frequency is a function of uh, is a, as a, is a function of frequency as well. So you have both spreading and twist in the wave field, and the twist is a new quantity. Um, how do we do this in a wave tank? There are challenges. You need a big wave basin with probably paddles on two walls. So how do you do it in CFD? We know how to do it. We just haven't got around to doing it yet, because you basically need a cylindrical uh, fluid domain. Um, does this matter? Well, it might matter for things like air gap, because the drought in the wave does not break as normal waves break with a horizontal jet at the top of the crest. It breaks with an upward inclined jet, and that might go into the deck of a platform. Um, just if we can play the movie, uh, the green one, just click on it or click the slide. It should, yeah, there it plays. Here's a crossing C. So you see the two wave trains at about 120 degrees to each other. Nothing much interesting is happening. They're going through each other, and all of a sudden, bang, that's the drought in the wave. And that's essentially the only way you can get a wave that high with that frequency content um, is to spread it as much as we have done. So there's some interesting physics to investigate there, and there are pushovers into uh, hurricane sea states, cyclone sea states. Next slide. OK, just a little bit on, on applications of wave groups and so on to, to wave power. When will refer to this very briefly? One area of interest that we have at the moment is the M4 machine uh, designed by Peter Stansby, a collaborator in Manchester. Three floats in the line with a central hinge and you take uh, power out through rotation of that hinge. It has the advantage of all the expensive, complicated bits above mean sea level, so they're easy, easy to fix when they break. The key thing about M4 is that it, you match the wave machine length to the average wavelength of waves at your location not to the really biggest waves, which generally much longer. And for longer waves, the machine just bobs up and down and there's very little relative motion. So to some extent, from that point of view, in extremes, its motion is self-limiting. It's also self-limiting by dunking the central float, which the uh, photos are meant to show the, the experiments done in uh, Plymouth. Uh, Hugh is running a program to install a quarter scale M4 in King George Sound at Albany. Hopefully it'll go into the water perhaps next year. Um, and that's been that's been supported by the Blue Economy, um, CRC and Western Australian state government. Next slide, please. Um, what about scaling? So we've hit M4 with small wave groups and large wave groups. The top two panels are small and large instant wave, fairly close to the front of M4. And then you, the 
two, the, the central panels and the bottom panel show hinge rotation and then the bending moment in the front in in one of the beam, in the front beam because that's a structural parameter and they all look fairly linear next slide please we can apply four phase decomposition and show that not only is the instant wave field fairly close to linear with some small bound harmonics but so are the machine responses so to to sort of come back to the question that dimitri asked a long time ago the advantage with them for its behavior is linear and we want its behavior to be linear until the motion is self-limited by dunking up one of the floats so harmonic decomposition is very helpful to investigate that for designer wave groups uh, when I showed this picture so if you hit m4 with a optimized new wave so maximizing surface elevation at a point so it's the top picture in black that induces a machine response in red, which has a magnitude just less than three. In the same C state, if you do a new wave calculation in response, you get a peak response in the bottom panel of about six, so twice as large. And the design wave looks nothing like a focus wave group. It has its phases very carefully controlled to maximize the response of the highly resonant machine. So this is just an example of how different the new wave in the undisturbed wave field and the design wave to maximize an extreme responses. But accessible via a new wave type argument. So where, what have we done? Where are we going? We've applied new wave wave groups and four phase decomposition to experiments, to numerical simulations of various types. Um, we have design waves already for linear responses, as I've just shown, and we're in the process of looking at design waves for nonlinear, linear plus nonlinear responses. And that's rather more complicated, best done in, prob in probability space, looking for the most likely extreme response. And the first paper that we're going to write on that will be on gaps, I think. Uh, and then we might move on to M4. Um, Limitations of all of this methodology. Well, the first one is tank time and computer power. That's always the case with experiments and, and numerical simulations. Um, from a physical point of view, treatment to things like slam loads, but we've already seen that CFD will do slam loads, it, both in the context of wave on deck and wave in deck. So I'm quite happy with that. Um, cost and time for both tank and, and, and and, and CFD, and also the need to convince regulators, etc., for the use of this methodology in, in practice. But it's but the, I think the, the regulators are receptive. DMV already discussed the use of wave groups in uh, their rules in several places. So I think at that point I'll finish. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, so that's uh, the end of the prepared material three minutes past finishing time. Um, it's been really good to have the discussions throughout. Um, but yeah, I mean, if there are other questions at the moment, we're happy to take them or alternatively, we can just chat afterwards. Um, any comments? Well, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, yeah, maybe start out a bit dry, but I hope it got more interesting. Um, and I hope you're, you know, um, convinced that some of these examples are interesting and would think about, you know, ways to do things differently for wave structure interaction, maybe use wave groups or at least think about, about where they could be valuable. Um, yeah, and there's some interesting discussions. Um, yeah, we're happy to talk about this sort of stuff anytime. Maybe just a quick vote of thanks from everyone. Uh, it's a lot of time and effort goes into preparing the materials, but it's also the summation of quite a few years worth of work from Mike Yu and Paul Leafen and, and several of the students as well. So.